Hey everybody, tonight we're debating whether or not the Flood of Noah happened, and we are starting right now with Erica Gutsick Gibbons' opening statement. Erica, thanks for being with us. The floor is all yours. Hey, that's me. All right, let me let me do the whole screen share deal and get my get my thing up here. Um, okay, can you guys see this? Yes, now we yes. can. Okay, cool. All right, let me get my timer ready here so I can keep track of things while I'm going here. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Erica Gutsik Gibbon here on YouTube. And uh, today, of course, we're talking about Noah's Ark and the global flood. It's topical for me. I'm doing a video right now, editing through a video right now on my recent trip to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum out in the Midwest, where I had the utmost pleasure to meet Noah himself. Ken Ham down there in the corner. We, it, he's, a, he's actually a very nice guy. Um, so I want to be very clear about what I'm going to be arguing here today. I'm arguing that the, the uh, bodies of science, the various bodies of science, do definitively preclude a global flood. Um, and the global flood is precluded thus by every field of science. That's, that's my thesis statement for the evening. So how do we know this? Well, we know this because the flood model, and of course there are many, but I, I'm using this as a singular because I do feel it's applicable to all of them, makes clear predictions that consistently fail. So creationists suppose that the following occurred during Noah's flood, which lasted approximately one year. They think all the rock layers in the geologic column, barring the basement granite, which is Precambrian in nature, were laid down. All the tectonic plates were moved from their supercontinent position to the current arrangement, and all impact events occurred, among other geologic phenomena. All the fossils in these layers were also deposited there during the flood, and all human, non-human and non-human animals today descend from the pairs and eight humans taken onto the ark itself. So I'm going to go with my kind of greatest hits of why I think you know, think and hold to the conventional opinion that there was no global flood. The first, of course, is my favorite. It's the heat problem. So in order to explain why radiometric dates universally indicate that the Earth is older than 6,000 years old, young Earth creationists need to invoke something called accelerated nuclear decay during the year of the flood. Young Earth creationists must cram 4.5 billion years of nuclear decay into 6,000 years, and this is a problem because decay releases heat, and they have 0.0001% of the time to disperse it. Naturally, this leads to quite a few problems. The heat amount depends on the model, but if you're going with answers in Genesis's catastrophic plate tectonics model, it's going to end up vaporizing the crust of the Earth and boiling off the oceans approximately 20 28 times over. And at worst, using Walt Brown's hydroplate hypothesis, we're seeing a thermal energy that's equivalent to 5,000 trillion one megaton H-bombs, which of course plasmifies the planet. Now, both of these numbers are gleaned from those organizations or individuals themselves. I did not calculate this. So you might be thinking, okay, well, what if they can manage or, manage or mitigate the heat? Every effort at heat mitigation has failed, which again is recognized by these professional creationists themselves. Cooling by the flood itself, space is a heat sink, space expansion cooling, hypercanes, mantle absorption, and many, many other bonkers ideas have been investigated, and to their credit, rejected by the professional creationists who are attempting to solve this problem. I detail a lot of this over on my own channel with panels of geologists and physicists who are professionals, um, and I'm actually doing it again this Sunday. So number two is going to be accelerated nuclear decay is currently impossible, and creationists know this. This means that ancient dates of the Earth do indeed preclude a global flood, because it's this global flood that is responsible for all the rock layers. As we all know, there is a law in physics called the radioactive decay law. It covers the nature of half-lives, and what it states is that decay rates don't change in meaningful ways in nature on the planet, so you can't do accelerated nuclear decay. Now, the rate scientists who are all young Earth creationists, at the end of their multi-year study, admitted that a young Earth creation position cannot be reconciled with the scientific data without assuming that exotic solutions will be discovered in the future. No known thermodynamic process could account for the required rate of heat removal, nor is there any known way to protect organisms from radiation damage. This is important because this isn't me saying this, this is them. It's an, it's an appeal to a miracle. Um, and of course, we know radiometric dating works because a $257 billion a year annual uh, industry depends on it, our, our fossil fuel industries. Limestone, this is another favorite one of mine for, for the flood, because there's a lot of problems with limestone. Limestone, among other minerals, is made from the skeletons of, uh, as skeletons and shells, rather, of trillions upon trillions of marine microorganisms. 10% of all sedimentary rock is limestone, of which most is marine. Marine is indicating, of course, that it's, um, this is coming um, from, from billions upon billions of itty-bitty, teeny-tiny, microscopic organisms. Now, limestone requires warm, calm waters with low pressure and acidity in order to accumulate. This is not going to be the kind of conditions that you're going to see in the greatest catastrophe of all time. 
Now, approximately, this is today's numbers, 1.5 times 10 raised 15 grams of calcium carbonate get deposited on the ocean floor. So a, dep a deposition rate approximately 10 times as high as this for 5,000 years prior to the flood would still only account for less than 0.02% of all limestone deposits. So it's not going to get you there. So creationists respond to limestone usually in two ways. They say, first, actually limestone can form very quickly thanks to these papers. And they'll reference these two I have here on the side. These papers aren't about limestone. They're about mudstone and shale. So it's, it's not applicable. And number two, limestone can actually form very quickly chemically. That is true, but limestone that's formed chemically is diagnostically different from biogenic limestone, which is what we see in things like the Cliffs of Dover, or not the Cliffs of Dover, other like red wall limestone, things like that. Uh, more, you know, a hundred meters thick of limestone that is composed of microorganisms that you can see under a microscope. So then they say, well, maybe, you know, when we when we perform that first one, the, those experiments that are mudstone and shale, maybe when we do it on limestone, it'll work then. No, because limestone can't be deposited by a current as far as we know, but when minerals are deposited by currents, we always see a, a formation called a flocule. Uh, flocules are found in all of the experiments that I just listed, um, and thus sedimentary rock, including limestone, should be just completely littered by flocules if they were formed in a global flood, but they aren't. Uh, and then also, why are we finding these enormous limestone layers which require warm waters to deposit incredibly slowly with no um, with no known uh, sort of in between, like they're, they're found constantly layered in between multiple other core types of layers. In a global flood situation, you're gonna see what we have in this cartoon that I made here <laughs> down to the bottom left. All the limestone should be on the top or it should all be on the bottom depending on the temperature of these global flood waters. That's a specific example, but we could also talk about chalk layers, which are problematic because objects this small settle of a rate of about 0 0.0000154 millimeters per second. In the year of the flood, they would have settled to about half a meter. We obviously see a lot more chalk than that in places like the Cliffs of Dover. Angular unconformities are no mechanism in the global flood for a quick deposition of um, a quick formation or deposition of things like this. Uh, granite batholiths, which are shoots of granite that have been injected into higher strata with heat pressure and time, and much, much more. Moreover, the heat problem for accelerated decay and plate tectonics during the year period makes it impossible for most, even the most rather robust microorganisms to survive, let alone uh, a wooden boat full of other life. So speaking of plankton, plankton are number five. Uh, they are microorganisms that can be seen evolving through the geologic column. There are 45 billion tons of planktonic biomass every year today just from phytoplankton. It's not even including zooplankton. Uh, and since phytoplankton, or plankton in general rather, evolved around 500 million years ago, and the flood is supposedly responsible for all of these rock layers, that's a lot of biomass. That's going to result in a sludge of microscopic life during the year of the flood. If this single year is to account for all of the geologic strata that we see, it has to account for all the plankton within that strata. That means they all lived within a year of each other, and that's going to get you a sludge. So we could talk too about the fossil record, um, there is no rabbit in the Cambrian. Fossil specimens are sorted in order of basal to complex emergence. This is in evolutionary order, and I've never seen a creationist explain this. They tend to try with uh -oh, rescuing devices. One is going to be your density or your hydrologic sorting, which is essentially like, well, you know, the flood sorted things by weight, in which case we shouldn't see basilosaurs in, you know, hundreds of millions of years or millions of years separated from mosasaurs or birds separated in a similar way to, um, to pterodons and the like. <clears throat> We could also do sorting the flood by habitat, which is called ecologic sorting. In this case, we should find geological columns that are spanning uh, uh, the flood layers in locations of the world with only dinosaurs or only mammals. But what we find is overlap. This doesn't make any sense if, if these organisms are living in uh, separate habitats, because what we find when we find these organisms is habitats are intact um, within those geologic strata. We find representatives from the entire habitat. To suggest that the flood washed an entire habitat along with organisms just in a perfect way as to mimic evolutionary theory, I think uh, is, is a bit silly. Then we could talk about primate diversity and human evolution because I am a, a primatologist. My MRES was in primate biology, behavior, and conservation. These are Japanese macaques. I think they're very cute. Um, and this is something I drummed up because human evolution is incredibly problematic for the global flood. Uh, all of the layers, if all the layers of the geologic column were deposited by a global flood, it cannot account for the human evolution that we see occurring in supposed post-flood layers because most creationists are going to take the position that the global flood stops at the end of the Cretaceous. And yet here's what we see, uh, slow morphological change over geologic time 
occur. And I, I composed this myself uh, because I, I thought we needed a really nice, more up-to-date than the ones we find at Talk Origins picture kind of displaying this. And here's a nice side view that you can see of these same exact specimens. And many of these are found, you know, again, in, in strata that are in the same location, just separated by a couple million years from one another. Uh, and then, of course, there's the question of primate kinds. As someone who studies primates, I think it's it just not acceptable at all that we don't have a clear definition for kinds. Hybridizability seems to be applied just in a very cherry-picked manner. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. For instance, all the cats are members of the same kind, uh, and all the dogs are members of the same kind, but, but, a, but a fox and a dog can't interbreed. So why are they the same kind? Um, well, we don't know the kind criteria, and I'd love to know it in the case of primates, because for all intents and purposes, when we look at the, the genetics, it's, it's looking like a chimpanzee is going to be more likely uh, to hybridize with a human or another hominin than it would be with, say, a gorilla, uh, given their genetic similarity, similarity. And then, of course, there are other assorted issues that preclude the global flood that I just don't have time to talk about. This would be things like this, the number of impact events that would have to occur in a single year. There's going to be a whole lot more heat the lethal radiation's impact on sea life and the passengers of the ark resulting from accelerating the nuclear decay, the trillions, that's trillions with a T, 15 to 150 based on, on recent papers uh, on the subject of stone tools found all across the African continent. There's just not enough post-flood time for people and or other apes to make them. There's gastroliths. These are very problematic. The radiometric dates of these gastroliths simply don't mesh even with the relative dating that creationists do accept because Gastroliths contain fossils from earlier flood rock. It, it, the, that gastroliths, for those of you who are maybe wondering, are, are stones that are consumed by dinosaurs, are found in the bellies of dinosaurs. So it, it doesn't really make very much sense that rock from the beginning of the flood from earlier in the year hardened, it, lith, it or formed, it lithified, it was reworked, and then it was consumed by a dinosaur. Uh, that, that's not really going to mess geologically speaking. Uh, then there's specific geologic structures, uh, DNM, National National Monument, the Castile Formation, the Grand Canyon. All of these have enormous problems for a global flood, uh, as well as coral reef formations and many, many more. So what Mr. Batman needs to do in order to make the global flood possible, that's not even probable, to make it possible, what he needs to do is he needs to solve the heat problems for, for the professional creationists. I think that would be nice. We've got to provide an experimental or observational basis for quickly depositing limestone chalk and, uh, and you know, mechanisms for angular unconformities and granite batholiths. We've got to provide a mechanism for sorting to explain the lack of large-scale mixing of mammals and the Paleozoic and Mesozoic animals. We have to solve issues related to planktonic life. And we have to provide a dispersal pattern and population growth rate that can account for animals in their current locations and human populations in post-flood locations. If the answer to any of this is miraculous, that's fine. But then it's no longer a scientific question and thus it's no longer science. So that's all I have to say. Let me stop sharing my screen here uh, and I'll shut up after my big monologue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Erica, for that opening statement. And what we will do now is kick it over to Mr. Batman for his opening statement. Also want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. And, folks, got to tell you this, it's a juicy one. You can see just right where I'm pointing this coming Tuesday, Aaron Ra will be returning to Modern Day Debate as he'll be debating Dr. Andrew Jackson. It's going to be epic and you don't want to miss it. So hit that subscribe button right now so that you don't miss it. And with that, we'll kick it over to Mr. Batman. Thanks for being with us. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. James. I do appreciate that. And Miss Erica, I think you ought to lay off the Red Bull because golly, you talk fast. <laughs> Now, that's how I am. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. I, I appreciate all the information. It's obvious you've actually do dove into this uh, according to your particular worldview. Uh, but I, again, I'm going to talk to you about my particular worldview and how I view things. Because the evidence that we have all around us, and a lot of the evidence that you raised uh, as evidence for your position, Actually, when you look at it in the light of, well, wait a minute, where did this come from? How did it form? Actually would be refuting your position. Um, I'm going to start off by quoting the scripture. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, when man began to multiply on the face of the land, you know, man's began to multiply. And God said, my spirit shall not abide with man forever, for he is flesh and his day shall be 120 years. So as we go on, man is being wicked. There's no laws. There, there's no uh, conformity of any type of uh, righteousness at all. 
But then there's Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Some translations actually call that perfect. Well, that's tamin in the original Hebrew, which means he had integrity. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end to all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. And then God goes into great detail about how he is going uh, to tell Noah to make the ark. Now, I've never done this before, Mr. James, so I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to try and share my screen at this point. Let's see if it'll work. Okay. You got it. So there we go. Look at that. I'm actually doing it. Um, once again, we have to start off with creation because that's where God started. God started with creation. He created everything in six literal 24-hour periods, and he rested on the seventh literal 24-hour period. He created the light. He created uh, the light in the earth. He separated the waters from the above from the waters below. Matter of fact, if you look at the word Elohim, it literally states that. Day three, he creates the land and the plants, four sun, moon, planets, and stars, five flying and uh, creatures and sea creatures. And then day six is the land animals, including dinosaurs and including man. So the, the age of the earth, see, we know the age of the earth is approximately 6,000 years. From Adam to Abraham, it's about 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus, about 2,000 years. Jesus to the present, about 2,000 years. For we are a total of 2,000 years. This is important to remember because there's other evidences besides um, radiometric dating and uh, carbon, uh, excuse me, radiocarbon dating, things of that nature that require long periods of time that actually give us much shorter periods of time. I love carbon-14 dating. Not that it can give us millions of years because it can't, but the most it can ever give us is about 80,000 years. But we find carbon-14 in samples that should not contain carbon-14. Carbon-14 decays at a known rate into nitrogen-14. Now, if we have a sample such as, oh, I don't know, a T-Rex femur bone, and that T-Rex femur bone is tested and we have measurable carbon-14 in it, you know what that tells us? It tells us that femur bone cannot be 65 million years old because there would be zero carbon-14, none. So once again, we have to understand why God judged the world with a global flood. It was because of man's actions, his disobedience. And, and people don't seem to realize it wasn't about the knowledge of good and evil because that's what they uh, acquired after they sinned. It was about what they did. They ate something they were not supposed to eat. You know, um, when we go outside of God's parameters for our lives, we suffer the consequences thereof. Now, the three big issues are the ark itself. How was it made? What was it made of? What was its size? Did it have enough room? Then the animals themselves. How did the animals get there? How did they have the right genetic material available to them uh, in order to have all the different kinds uh, descend from those first two kinds? Because he didn't have to have every animal on the ark. He didn't have to have every type of dog on the ark. He just had to have the first pair of dogs that had all the genetic material necessary for all the different types of dogs we see to descend from that first pair. And then the flood itself. How did all these things occur? Well, the first thing we have to understand, this is not the ark, okay? This is what I call a bathtub ark. This is what we teach our children. Oh, isn't that lovely? Isn't that cute? This is what you see on the, the, the walls of most uh, churches in their little children's area. But you know what this is telling children? That the ark is a fairy tale. The ark did not look like this. The ark had plenty of room for all of the animals that, that Noah took on board, two of every unclean and seven of every clean animals. Uh, he had plenty of room if for the hundred years while he was creating the ark, uh, while he was preaching to those people who were helping him build this ark, if any of them had decided to repent, he had plenty of room for people to come on board, yet none of them did. So this is not the ark of which we're talking. The ark size itself is extremely large. A cubit is about uh, 20.4 inches. 
So the length of the uh, arc would have been about 300 cubits or 510 feet. The width would have been 50 cubits, about 85 feet. The height would have been 30 cubits, about 51 feet. Again, if you want to look at that in stories, uh, the height of the arc would have been about 10 stories. So here's get you a little idea of the size of the arc itself. It's over a football field long. It has three different decks on the inside of it. It is of the perfect structure, the perfect structure lengthwise, uh, widthwise. This is the perfect structure for being on the ocean and not tipping over, keeping the animals uh, at, a, at a much uh, level pace, even in rough seas, so they don't get sick and possibly die as well. So once again, the, the arc is about a football field and a half long, two school buses wide, and three giraffes stacked head on head tall. Again, that's about uh, three stories tall. Now, the volume of the arc itself, well, well this is a, a, the truck trailer, 18-wheel truck trailer. So the volume of the arc would have been about 483 semi-trailers it could have held. Now, what kind of animals were on the ark? We have not only all land-breathing animals and man, of course, we had Noah and his family, but we had, um, uh, again, possibly creeping things. We had birds. Uh, we have all different kinds of animals on the ark, plus food, fresh water, all these different things that they would have needed. Um, they would have had plenty of room for all of these things that they brought along with them. Here is also another example of the size of the ark. The ark itself would have been a little over 500 feet long. It shows uh, the Santa Maria, the Wyoming. Both of those were wooden ships. Then you get to the Titanic and then the Queen Mary. All of these show the different size differences in the ark. The ark itself was taller, longer, or wider. If it was any taller, longer, or wider, then it would not have functioned the way God had designed it to do. It, had, it was designed for maximum comfort for both the humans and the animals. It was maximum uh, balance, <laughs> maximum stability, and maximum strength to withstand the stresses of being out there on the open ocean during this time. You see, Satan has done the same thing right from the very beginning. And his, uh, he, the serpent came and whispered into Eve's ear, did God really say that? Did God really say this? Did, did this God really say that there was a flood? Did God really say that he was going to judge the world with the flood? Here's the problem. If Satan can convince you that the flood was not real, then he's going to be able to convince you that heaven and hell are not real as well. And once again, we've got to get back to creation because the creation is the start of the entire uh, thing. Everything that we observe here in the physical world, you have creation then you have the corruption, that's man's sin. Then you have the catastrophe, that's the global flood of Noah. Then you have the confusion, that's the Tower of Babel and God confusing the languages. Then you have the Christ, Christ being delivered to this planet, living a perfect life, and then going to that cross to pay the price for our sins. And then you'll have consummation when he comes back for his bride at the end of time. So once again, there was plenty of room on the ark for dinosaurs. The average dinosaur would have been about the size of a buffalo. Um, the juvenile dinosaurs would have been the one that they would have taken because they would have had the longest reproductive period. Dried meat for carnivores, uh, carniv carnivorous animals could have been provided. Me personally, I believe that they were still eating fruit, uh, vegetables. So I do not believe that there were carnivorous animals. This is where Ken Ham and I differ just a little bit. And the estimated uh, 60 to 80 dinosaur kinds mean there would have been a total of less than 200 total dinosaurs on the ark. So once again, plenty of room on the ark. So let me go ahead and stop sharing there. So once you talk about all the different scientific problems. You mentioned evolution in a number of different scientific arenas. Um, unfortunately, from your position, you're not going to be able to justify any of those positions. Because if you're going to be able to do science, you're going to have to have the God of the Bible, of which I just quoted, the one who said, in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. Because everything you just pointed to, all the different uh, forms of science require natural laws. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, you actually mentioned a natural law. And a natural, I happen to be a science teacher. A natural law is a pattern observed in the physical world repeatedly and exclusively without contradiction. That means 
Number one, you have to justify where these laws come from. Number two, you have to justify why they don't change over time in an ever-changing world. And number three, you have to uh, justify why they're going to be here tomorrow so you and I can discuss the evidence that we have in front of us again today. Now, we can both look at the, the lovely skulls that you have behind us, and you're going to look at those skulls through your evolutionary glasses. And by the way, your glasses are quite lovely. Uh, but um, I'm going to look at my uh, the evidence through my creation glasses. Because uh, I used to be an atheist. I, I used to be like you, man. And so I used to look at these things and say, there's no how, no way, no God created none of this. But then as I begin to look at the evidence of these skulls, the skulls have a specific design that houses, the, the cranium is designed to house and protect protect the brain. The eye sockets are designed for the muscles to hook to so your eyes can focus and also protect the eyes. Your jaws are designed to be able to open and close so you can take in food and chew up that food, the beginning of the digestive system. Once again, every single system in the body is designed to function the way God designed it to work. Just like he designed that ark to work, just like he uh, protected Ad, excuse me, uh, uh, Noah and his family on the ark, and just as he provided every animal to come to the ark, so Noah didn't have to go after him. These animals had all the genetic material necessary for all the different kinds to descend from them. And there's another thing you have to be able to justify is information. Because that information inside each and every one of these kinds of animals, again, is specified complex arrangement of symbols that performs a function or conveys a message utilizing a transmitter, a receiver, and an agreed-upon language. So, once again, we have three billion, and I like how you said that earlier, with a B, three billion with a B, base pairs in our genome. That's specified complex uh, information that's def definitely using a template. That's why we can tell normal from abnormal. 20 seconds Because, left. thank you. Uh, so, once again, um, that's where I'm going to just leave it right there. Uh, we have all this just information that points to a loving creator God who designed us to function this way, who actually shows us the evidence of the sedimentary layers of the Grand Canyon, all these different things that fossils themselves point to a loving God who judged the world and he will come and judge it again, but not this time with the flood. The next time he's going to judge it with fervent heat, fire. Thank you very much for listening. We are going to jump into open conversation, folks. So I want to let you know if you have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, that makes it easier for me to see your questions. And then we read super chats first. So thanks so much for all of your questions, folks, as we get to the Q&A in about an hour from now. So with that, we will kick it into that open dialogue mode, as I mentioned. And by, by the way, folks, our guests are linked in the description. If you haven't clicked on their links yet, what are you waiting for? They're waiting for you right now. All right. Erica and Mr. Batman, thanks so much. Yeah, cool. Perfect. Um, okay, so here's something that I, I kind of want to start some start off here with with a, a very uh, a specification, if you will. In science, as as you know, there's a difference mm -hmm. between support for or against something, as in evidence that would preclude something from happening, right? Uh, and an open question. Right. So there's a difference between me saying the, the law of gravity on Earth precludes when I drop my pen, the pen from falling up. Uh, and there's a difference between saying that and like, OK, well, we may not understand the nature of dark matter yet. That doesn't mean dark matter doesn't exist. Right. It just means we don't understand it. Uh, and I tend that tends to be what, where I end up beginning things when I'm discussing something like young earth creationism, because when it comes to something like the origin of life, I'm, I'm more than happy to say that's an open question. Abiogenesis is, is um, explicitly a different field though, from, from evolution. And it's for this reason and the age of the earth for that matter. It's for this reason that the majority of Christians here in the United States, majority of religious people here in the United States and in Europe uh, accept both an ancient age of the earth and evolution. So the, the kind of wrap up for that to ask you a question is that first problem that I presented, that heat problem, that's that's a preclusion. You, you can't accelerate the decay in order to get the dates that we see today um, unless you're, you're appealing to a miracle or you've got a very large heat problem um, because that's going to be releasing quite a bit of heat. So as you said earlier, as you said just a moment ago, um, with natural laws, they act without contradiction. And I wanted to add that they also act, they tend to act in physics without exception. So how do you solve that problem? 
Oh, that's not a problem at all. Um, when you're talking about this heat issue, uh, this decay of the radioactive material to, to a certain degree, um, that's not an issue because, again, we're not uh, millions of years old. And again, these dating methods are based on huge assumptions. When you're talking about radiometric dating, radiocarbon dating, anything that's going to use a half-life of more than, let's say, 75 to 100,000 years, some of them use half-lives of a million years, um, you're basing this on many assumptions. There's at least three, sometimes as many as eight different assumptions when you're talking about using these types of dating methods. Um, so once again, if you start off any equation with a question mark, you have no valid answer. You can have an inference. You can have uh, a, an inferred date. But that's why I like uh, uh, carbon-14 dating. Once again, it still uh, starts off with assumptions, but we know that it has a half-life and it can never give you a date over 80,000 years. So if you find something that has carbon-14 in it, you know that that thing cannot be over 80,000 years old, or there would be no carbon-14. I, I would love to talk about the carbon-14. I have a lot to say about that. I made a video very, very recently that was, as, as you will come as a shock to you, very long-winded, <laughs> uh, that where I was going into uh, quite a bit of that and a lot of the technical literature surrounding it, because there's there's a lot that's interesting with, with carbon-14 dating, particularly as to its uses when compared to something like argon-argon dating. Um, but I, I want to back it up there for a second, because those assumptions that you're talking about, that that's like analogous to saying that there's assumptions in assuming that that a law of gravity works, right? Because the law of radioactive decay is a law of physics, the assumptions are simply that physics has always acted in the same way throughout time. Um, in order to get it to not act in the same way, again, that's going to be an appeal to a miracle because as, as humans, we've thrown absolutely everything we can at radioactive elements in order to increase this decay rate because it would be huge for us economically if we could in, uh, induce a, a accelerated radioactive decay. Uh, but we've been unable to do it. We can't, no matter how hard we try. It's for this reason that the geologists that work for Answers in Genesis, as I mentioned in my presentation, they know that there isn't a solution to this currently. That's why they started the rate team that it, it began, I believe, in the early or in the late 90s, but it ended in mm -hmm. 2005. And their conclusion is that we have to appeal to a miracle or dis discover some kind of exotic solution in the future because currently there isn't one. Currently, to explain the dates that exist as they are, this is from Andrew Snelling, I'm sure you know he works for AIG. Um, Snelling, Snelling himself is in on this, uh, uh, not in on it in, in like a conspiratorial way. He is um, on board with it, I suppose would be a, a better way of putting it. As in he's saying, yeah, this, this, is, a, this is a huge issue. Um, so the assumptions I don't think are going to help you here. It's, it's just a law of physics. It, I mean, are you, are you suggesting maybe that the, the law of physics used to be different? Are you appealing to a miracle? No, ma'am. What I'm saying is I do not believe this is an issue since we are a young earth. These things are not going to be a problem. The God who created the laws of physics, he designed these things to work in a certain way. Your position is presupposing a particular situation where you're going to have this heat problem. I don't look at it that way. I don't believe that's an issue. Now, and this, this is another area where I do not agree with answers in Genesis. Um, again, I don't think that's an issue. If you're going to appeal to a decay rate, if you're going to appeal to a scientific method, if you're going to appeal to laws of cause and effect, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, do those laws ever change over time? No, they don't. Why? If we live in an ever-changing world. That's the second law of thermodynamics. That's the laws of entropy. Everything decays over time. But wait a minute. These laws don't decay over time. What causes these laws, these cosmological constants to be in place, what causes them not to change over time, and why are they going to be here tomorrow so we can have this conversation one more time? See, God has taken that all into consideration when he created, when he actually performed the catastrophe to judge the earth with a flood. All of these things, the creator of the universe, when he said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, if he can do that, He's in control of every other aspect of the physical world. I don't think that this heat issue is actually an issue at all. But in order for it to not be an issue, you have to find some way to, to effectively break physics as we understand it. Because as you just mentioned, it, this, is, this is falling directly in line with the, the, the other kinds of constants in physics that we understand. Mm -hmm. This is just a law of radioactive decay. So either there, there are only two options, right? It's like either 
God inter intervened and protected everything from the heat in, in this miraculous way because the, there has to be accelerated decay or God caused there not to be accelerated decay, thereby, again, breaking another law of physics is that, you know, there's there's heat as a byproduct here. So either way, in order to not get the heat, there's got to be something miraculous. Yes, there could be that, or that could be a false dichotomy, and God could have set it up this way right from the very beginning, so the heat was not an issue. He could have set it up to where the decay rates were not an issue in the very beginning, just like time itself was different in the very beginning because us being on the event horizon, the decay rates could have been different. See, we weren't there, and I, we could make all kinds of assumptions all day long because we, we don't observe that, but what we do observe are these laws of logic, these laws of physics, these laws of nature. Now, we do observe them every single day. Once again, I would rather stick with things we do observe and how do those things work that we can observe today. Um, God could have performed a, mir a miracle to do what you're saying he, he could have done. Absolutely, that's definitely possible. Or it could have been created originally, so this is not an issue to begin with. Uh, so once again, that's a false dichotomy when you said it has to be this or that. But then it has to change because currently it is an issue. Like the, the current observation that we make, right, of, of nuclear decay, whether we're doing it in, in some kind of nuclear power plant or, or we're observing it in like a chemistry lab at a very small scale, when we observe nuclear decay, what we see is a release of heat, right? Mm -hmm. So all all I've done with this, and, and you know, again, like, it's not just me that says this, it's the, the, the professional creationists who are at work on this are trying to find a solution because it's a problem. Mm -hmm. When you wind it back to, to like, because obviously the way that, for those of you who may be wondering the audience, just in case, I, because I didn't explain this and I usually do, the way that nuclear decay works with relation to radioactive decay or radiometric dating, it's like an hourglass. So, the way that it kind of works is you've got parent and daughter material. Parent material will spontaneously decay into daughter material, and it does so at a constant rate. This is yeah. That's the radioactive decay law. It does so at a constant rate, as far as we can tell, no matter what kind of chemicals or electromagnetic fields or, you know, all sort of gravitational pull, whatever, whatever we throw at it, we can't seem to get it to alter. Um, and we look at that ratio, knowing the rate and knowing the current state of certain elements, we can wind that clock backwards using the known rate to find out when this rock was formed. If it's an igne if it's an igneous rock, that's usually what we do. Um, it has to be igneous to radiometrically date it. So those that's there aren't any assumptions that are being made. It's just has the radioactive decay or radioactive de yeah radioactive decay law always worked the same way? And as you said, these laws of I mean this is what you said. The laws of physics are mm -hmm. constant. So it's not mm -hmm. it's not an assumption to say. I mean, it is, but it, it's in the same way that we would say gravity has always worked the same way. So to me, the only option is that God, if God made it so that it wasn't a problem, the only way that I can see that working is that he made it so it wasn't a problem until he changed it to look like it was. And that to me seems like it violates God's character. Now, once again, I don't think he changed it to make it look like it was a problem. You see, once again, you're basing your assumption on these dating methods being uh, valid and provable, which they are not. We've just discussed a moment ago that you don't know how much of the parent material was in there uh, to start off with. You don't know how much of the daughter material was in there to start with. So you've got two assumptions right there. You're not sure, even though we see the decay rate being constant over time now, you don't know for sure that it's always been constant over time. So there's another factor right there. Plus there's many, there's many other factors that can come into play. So when it comes to the aging factor, um, again, I, I, that's fine. If you want to call it a miracle, I'm good with that. Uh, okay. But again, I, I, I'm really not concerned with that, mainly because these dating methods cannot be validated using the methods that you're stating because of the assumptions. But that's the interesting thing, though, and I, I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget it. You said it's an assumption that how much parent and how much daughter was at the beginning. So if you're assuming the assumption, if you're assuming one is the same, if you're doing the other, because they're obviously in an inverse relationship with one yes. another. But the way that we know this is because we observe igneous rock forming today. Now. And without, yeah, now. So mm -hmm. without a doubt, without exception, we see it forming with all parent, 
no daughter. There, there is one tiny exception. Um, there is a specific type of magma chamber that can mix things up, but then you're not really looking at a newly formed igneous rock because there was altering actually in the mantle. But we can also tell when that happens because we do things like seismic scans. So the point is, is that to me, that's again saying that it changed. Because if you're saying that we don't know the amount of parent, well, isn't that just an assumption that it had to have been different than it is now in order to explain it under your specific worldview? Because what we observe now contradicts what you just said. It's always all parent at the beginning. So if we find stuff like uranium, right, or, or uh, other radioactive elements that appear to be billions of years old, according to everything we currently observe, they have to be. Actually, no, they don't. Because once again, when you look at how God created the heavens and the earth, when he created the heavens and the earth, was the earth billions of years old when he created it? No, it might have a, it might have had an appearance of age, just like Adam and Eve when they were created. They were created with a appearance of age. If you were to see Adam and Eve right after they were created, day one, they would have looked like they were about thirty years old. Once again, this is not an issue for the creator of the universe. So I, I just think it's a non-issue. The main thing that we still have to deal with is if you're going to look at these decay rates. Now, yes, we do see things like this going on today. Does that mean it's always been like that in the past? That's uniformitarianism. You can't justify that. You can't say it's always been like that in the past. Now, what we can do, though, is we can actually look at natural laws, like laws of gravity, magnetism, thermodynamics, these cosmological constants that have to be there for us to function. Now, once again, if we're talking about life and we're talking about our realm where we live and we're talking about the flood of noah god judged the entire world with a flood and he killed a bunch of people millions of them to be exact so wait a minute let's go ahead and get back on the topic here the topic is god judging the entire world with a global flood now wait a minute where does the life come from to begin with for it to be judged where does morality come from? See, you're focusing on one issue, which I don't think is an issue at all. Personally, I think it's a red herring because, again, I've already said, hey, if it was a miracle, it was a miracle. If you want to classify that as a miracle, that's fine by me. But I'm, I've also pointed out that God created Adam and Eve with an appearance of age. He could have also created the world with the particular decay rate at a certain level. Now, it's not it's not an issue for me. What I'm talking about is now we have to determine creation. Where did the first life come from? H how did that life, because you, you're a, a believer in evolution, how did that life go from a single-celled organism to two people who know what right and wrong are? So the thing about that, though, is that physics, the laws of physics aren't uniformitarianism. Like the laws of physics are like laws are separate from a uniformitarianist, per, uniformitarianist perspective within geology. Those two things are separate. I don't think it's fair to call like, oh, gravity's always been the same. Oh, that's a uniformitarian perspective. Not really. It's a law of physics, which is why I keep bringing it up. Um, and, and the problem is I, I understand the appearance of age thing. I have two issues with that. The appearance of age doesn't work from, in my opinion, one, because I used to be a theistic evolutionist. I, I used to be an agnostic, and I'm an agnostic currently, but used to be um, a, a TE. But the problem with the appearance of age is, in my opinion, I think it violates God's character. It feels inherently deceptive. But from a more scientific perspective, the issue with the appearance of age is that it cannot explain why we see the gradient moving upwards with the lower basement rocks being older and getting proceedingly younger as we move up the geologic column. Why would they be ordered in the way that they are if there was a if they were created with this appearance of age? It would have to be a massive coincidence that that the rocks were all created to look, you know, all sorts of different ages and then the flood washes them all up and lays them down just to make them look old. And it's that for that reason why in the first place Andrew Snelling said we've got to have accelerated nuclear decay to explain why it is that we're seeing this gradient. Obviously, these elements being exposed to something that was going on in the flood was aging them very rapidly, giving them the appearance of this age. And that's where we reach the crux of the problem, which is the heat that's expressed in order to reach those ages. But and I understand again, that we, you, you know, because we've kind of been beating this topic for a while. If, if you want to move with the it's a miracle or we don't know it yet, I'm cool with that. Um, let's talk about carbon dating. I think that would be a good one. Because I have a lot to say about that. 
So carbon dating in dinosaur bones, it's not just dinosaur bones. Christians tend to bring it up with dinosaur bones, diamonds, coal, all sorts of stuff like that. There's carbon where it shouldn't be, uh, according to the to the evolutionary perspective, I suppose you would say, the, the conventional perspective. Mm-hmm. And there's something very interesting to me about that because of all the different you know, two dozen or so dating methods, it's only carbon dating that seems to have these exceptions to them. So that's kind of what got me going on. Well, why is this? What's going on? Um, And why aren't the other scientists bothered by it? And the answer is actually very simple. With carbon dating, carbon is so easy to reintroduce into another organic sample. This can occur via cosmic radiation. And then I wrote down my other notes because I always forget them and I had them at the tip of my tongue while you're speaking. It can occur by recrystallization, paramineralization, and crustacean, bacterial contamination, and uranium contamination. And so I thought to myself, okay, if all of these six odd things are potential ways to reintroduce carbon, let me look at the samples that the creationists are presenting and let's find out if any of them could possibly right, could possibly be subject to any of these. So the one I went with was Andrew Snelling and his finding a, a piece of, of tree wood, a piece of, a piece of wood uh, encased in basalt. And the tree wood dated millions of years younger than obviously because the rate of carbon dating rate only gets up to like 80,000 years right. than the basalt that surrounded it. And so I'm reading the paper and I'm like, this is really weird. And then I go down to the sampling section and this wood was in a seam that was constantly exposed to water percolating down from the surface. This introduced pretty much everything from the surface down to this this individual individual wood sample, which is why when it was peer reviewed by other individuals and they said, hey, can't we get a better sample? Something that wasn't, that that was better encased, right? Um, Snelling didn't do it, despite the fact that there was more to do in this scene. So it was very, in my opinion, this was very clearly contaminated. You can do this with the dinosaur bones. You can do this with the diamonds. The diamonds are often found near um, uranium patches, which again introdu- reintroduces carbon. There are just a lot of different ways to do it. So I don't really find that compelling. If you're going to you know, dunk on radiometric dating, the real thing to contend with, if you're, if you're a creationist, is the fossil fuel industry. Right. That shouldn't exist if radiometric dating doesn't work. I don't understand that. What? The, that the fossil fuel industry? Why, what, why would the radiometric dating have a, an issue with the fossil fuel industry? Because geologists like um, I don't know if you know this. My my um, or you, why would you? My uh, fiance's brother worked out on an oil field out in the uh, it was a Permian mm-hmm. deposit out in West Texas. And um, the interesting thing about, he's actually a lineman, but he knew some of the the oilmen that worked out there. And if you look into any of these large fossil fuel companies from Exxon, you know, to Shell, all of these guys, they hire a lot of geologists. And the reason they hire these geologists, these specific petroleum geologists, is because these geologists have to be trained in something called basin modeling. Basin modeling involves radiometric dating out the wazoo because it is extremely cost ineffective to just shoot lasers down into the ground to say, okay, well, maybe there's oil here. Maybe there's coal here. It's a lot smarter to go out and survey the rock and say, this is a Permian deposit or this is a Carboniferous deposit because you know what the Carboniferous always has? Coal. So they hire geologists who are all, and you can see this on on any kind of undergraduate or postdoc or PhD geology um, uh, education Uh, pathway, effectively. They all take classes on basin modeling if they're going to be petroleum geologists. So the question would be, I think, is why then has someone not stepped up and said, I'm going to find oil using flood geology? And the funny thing is, someone did. Zion Oil stepped up and said, we're going to use flood geology exclusively to find oil and they effectively went bankrupt and had to switch to reutilizing basin modeling and geology. So the point is, radiometric dating shouldn't work the way that it does if the Earth isn't very isn't is not very ancient. Accelerated nuclear K just doesn't work because it creates a heat problem. So there's got to be some kind of relationship here within the creationist flood model that fixes both those problems. Once again, I don't see an issue with that because the issue is if we have a creation, if we have uh, Earth and we have radioactivity and we have a decay rate and this decay rate is steady and it can be measured, then you're using science 
which means you're using the uniformity of nature, which means you are appealing to the Christian God who gives you the uniformity of nature. Genesis chapter 8, verse 12, Hebrews chapter 1. See, you're using all these different scientific methods to disagree with what the Bible says. And I'm fine with that. If you want to try and say hey, this is a heat problem, I don't think so. I don't believe it's a heat problem at all, because what you're doing is you're appealing to laws of nature without justifying those laws of nature. Now, if you're going to appeal these laws of nature, where did they come from? Why don't they change over time? Because, again, you're you're needing these things to be consistent over time for you to do any type of science whatsoever. Now, I love science. I teach uh, elementary science all the way up through high school science. And I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot do science without laws of cause and effect, without laws of chemistry, without laws of biology. Um, these things are absolutely necessary. Now, these were in the creation. That's why I started with creation. God created. Now, God's not going to have a problem. He's not going to be set off. Oh, my goodness. I didn't think of the heat problem. No, God's not going to have a problem with that. Now, because I cannot explain it thoroughly, not a problem whatsoever. The God of creation has this under control. So the problem you have to have on your side is, again, fossils. Fossils are proof that something was once alive and now it's dead. Where do living things come from? Um, living things that have multiple systems inside them, irreducibly complex systems that have to be all together simultaneously. They have information. They use uh, information in order for the cells to function. These information systems uh, use complicated uh, systems such as a transmitter, a receiver, and agreed upon language. Um, when you, when I'm talking about irreducibly complex to, systems, I hate to interrupt, but just because it's been a, a, a lengthy one, and, and also just that, in terms of the topic, uh, though induction, I understand what you're saying in terms of it being kind of a bedrock foundation of science. I understand that, although at the same time without drifting too much into philosophy, bringing it back toward the flood is one thing I want to mention. Sure. And then as well as... Yeah, I... I oh, sorry. Go ahead, James. Sorry. Well, I jumped in. Go ahead. I if you have a response, I, we didn't give no, you a no, all, all I, Erica. No, no. All I was going to say is I, I just... I, I think all of that is a is a conversation that's worth having. I just don't think it's, it's the one... It's not the one that I'm trying to have now. I mean, I, I realize that it seems... It can seem, I guess, if you're jumping into the conversation from chat or whatever, that it's not relevant, but I'm trying to draw together this, this, what I think is the big problem. Cause the title of the debate's like, okay, did the flood of Noah happen? I don't think it did because I think that there are two, there are large problems that are, I believe insurmountable uh, for it that involve the relationship between uh, radioactive decay of elements and accelerated nuclear decay. That's typical for the creation model and, and the flood. Uh, but I can understand why, why that feels a little bit like it, it might be starting to veer off topic. Um, I do like fossils. I like talking about fossils quite a bit. I think the fossils are in and of themselves problematic. I think that they preclude the flood as well, um, mostly because of their order. I don't think that I've ever seen a compelling model, if you will, or mechanism by which we can see the ordering of the fossils that we see from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, or I believe some creationists will go up to like... Um, like the, the Maya scene or something like that, however far you want to go. Um, I don't think that basal to complexity thing checks out with regard to a global flood. Um, and I kind of talked about like hydrologic sorting versus ecological zonation, why I don't think those things work. Um, do you have like a different mo or mechanism for that maybe? Sure. Billions of dead things laid down by sedimentary layers of water all over our planet. This would have been a global flood in a tsunami type formation. This is why we can find animal tracks that are trying to flee uh, the rising waters. Once again, when we're talking about these fossils, fossils are formed in a very unique way. When something dies, it just doesn't fossilize. It, it, there are decomposers in our environment that actually decompose uh, the organism. There's also um, uh, animals that uh, go ahead and eat the, uh, the carcass, um, the carrion. So once again, you have all these different systems that take the animal carcass and dissolve it back into the environment. But wait a minute, what causes a fossil? And what causes fossils to happen so quickly? It has to be a catastrophic event. Um, along the mountain range of Mount Everest, we have millions 
with an M, millions of fossilized clams along that mountain range. And what's interesting is they're all in the closed position. Um, why is that important? Well, because they all were catastrophically buried very quickly. They didn't have time to die and open up. So, so that's one. I, yeah. Oh, one, one second, one second. And also we have other fossils that show that this has happened very quickly. Uh, we have a fossilized uh, uh, icterus, I believe it is, that's fossilized in the process of giving birth. So that takes, it's fossilized very quickly, catastrophically. We have uh, examples of fossils that are fossilized in the process of eating other animals. We have, I saw one uh, group of fossils, there was a whole school of fish fossilized all mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, trying to escape the, the flood dynamic as well. So once again, these fossils are proof that something was once alive and now it's dead. And fossilization is a unique event has to be catastrophic, it has to be quick, it has to take the air out. And um, once again, we only see that in a flood dynamic. So I, I'm going to push back quite a bit on that. One, fossils don't just flood, or don't just form in, in flood conditions. They form when they're separated, like you said, from things that are scavenging, right? Scavenging, uh, bacteria, classic decomposing processes, classic processes of decomposition. But um. Falling into a, a, a tar pit can do that. Slipping into a eutrophic lake can do that. Mudslides can do that. Bogs can do that. Uh, amber can enclose certain kinds of organisms and preserve them. Now, the majority of fossils don't tend to be preserved that way. Water tends to be evolved, involved a lot because it's so good at carrying sediment and protecting a dead organism from actually being consumed or, or broken down uh, by other environments or by, or by other um, uh, factors within the environment. With regard to the clams, those are actually brachiopods. Those, those organisms on top, they're not the same as they're actually like uh, fundamentally different than the clams, the types of bivalves that we see today. And these brachiopods actually don't, they're not, they don't have the same physiology as the clam where they close up when they're rapidly buried. So it, I, I've heard Kent Hovind use that one before. I don't think it's a very good one. The ichthyosaur is a better one, but the thing with that and with the school of fish as well, and I know this for sure with the school of fish, and I, if memory serves, it's the same with the ichthyosaur and with some of the other, uh, within like in media res, in the middle of things type of burials, is all of them that I've seen have traces of subterranean landslide movement. So there are diagnostic characteristics of a subterranean landslide. We know this, or so like subterranean, submarine landslide. Um, and the way that we know this is because they happen today. We see submarine landslides happen and we see what kind of traces yeah. they leave. And so we know what they look like. Almost always- But that's to be kinds, expected. But that's to be expected in a global sure, flood. Sure, it just becomes indistinguishable at that point. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, oh, shoot, what was it? It was, um, oh, yes, this is a big one. A whole lot of these fossils that are buried in things like big dinosaur graveyards where, the, oh, all the bones are jumbled up in these big, like, logs in a jam, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are caused by, by seasonal flooding events. And you might be saying, well, that's very convenient. And I thought that it sounded very convenient, too. So I looked into it. And the reason why we know that these are seasonal flooding events rather than a massive global flood is because some of these bones cross strata. So like you'll have a strata here and the bone will be laying like this. And the bone at the bottom half is completely pristine. The top half of the bone has nibbling, it has back to signs of, of uh, ancient bacterial invasion, roots grow into it, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then the very next layer is also from the same, like, you know, we can trace these ancient rivers up and down the, yep. the bed. It's from the same source. So it doesn't make any sense if these, if these organisms are being buried by a global flood, why so often do we see differences in the same specimen, and pretend my pen is a bone, and like the distal end versus the proximal end of clear scavenging. Because as you just said, that scavenging shouldn't happen if these things are being wholly buried right off the bat. But it's a diagnosis. But not all of them are being wholly buried. It's now, true. What you, what you do have is when you have a, this global flood scenario, these are tsunami-like actions that come in. They bury the initial part, like you're talking about. They might leave pieces of the animal sticking up. The other animals that are still trying to escape the flood, they come by. They, a lot of their food sources are gone. They're going to scavenge on this, and then the next wave of the tsunami comes in. See, people have a misconception uh, that when God flooded the earth, it just filled up like a bathtub all of a sudden. 
That's not the way it occurred. As a matter of fact, Answers in Genesis does have a great video that talks about the global tsunami effect and why we see this in uh, the dinosaur graveyards. So I think an issue with that, though, is that, and I, I saw that at the Creation Museum, and the first thing, or it might have been the Ark Encounter, uh, the problem that I have with it is that you shouldn't be able to make out these ancient environments and, and re-piece them together. So like the way, like I said, we the, the conventional explanation is that these are seasonal floodings along river sides. So if the conventional science is correct on this, the further you go from the sides of the river, you shouldn't see any flood damage in that strata, right? Because if it's a flood up from a river, it's only going to reach so far up outside of the banks. And we see this in flash floods now. I used to live in a house that was very close to a river. And every time it would rain a lot, we'd all get really nervous that it was going to flood the basement. Um, but it never really did reach up that far. So if an ancient, if a, a future paleontologist were to discover my house and, and the seasonal flooding that occurred at this river, they would be able to look at where my house was and say, yeah, the, the, the river never reached this house because we don't find signs of, um, we don't find like is proper isotopic ratios and things of that nature that shows that it was being inundated. Um, and that's but what when they see. find when they find your house, you know what they're going to find? They're going to find somebody who built that house. And that's the whole point of these fossils to begin with. These fossils are living creatures that have irreducibly complex systems that were designed by a creator. And he saved a select few of them on the ark. Now, this is the entire argument right here. This is why there are fossils, because God judged the entire world with a flood. Now, we can, we can argue these points back and forth. We weren't there, and we can come to all kinds of different conclusions based on the same evidence. Just, just like I was talking about earlier, you're going to look at it through your evolutionary glasses. I'm going to look at it through my creationist glasses. But the thing is, you're, just in, like in your example with your house, anybody that looks at that house is going to say somebody built that house. It's complicated. It's pragmatic. It has a purpose. It, it has a specific design and somebody had to have built it. It didn't happen by itself. Now, wait a second. Now, wait a minute. I want you to tell me how you explain life. Where do these complicated systems come from that could be buried in this global flood? Because that's what we're getting at. These fossils are billions of dead things that were alive at one point that have a multiplicity of systems that are irreducibly complex in their own right, but interdependent upon other irreducibly complex systems. So they couldn't have happened by themselves. How do you explain the living thing that is now dead and fossilized? Like the evolution of specific organisms or like how they look the way that they do. I mean, that's, that's a very hefty topic to cover. I would need quite a bit of time to really get into how, in my opinion, the types of literature that I find compelling with regard to the origin of life and how they got to the areas that they got to today. Okay. Again, I have to emphasize that there's a huge difference. Again, this is why there are so many Christians that accept evolution, because there's a difference between organisms that already exist changing over time, uh, or even having a common ancestor, and abiogenesis. These are two completely different topics, and I'm okay with having that conversation. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's going to be, like, if we were to get certain, sorry, I just hit my mic. If we were to start getting into that now, we'd be, we'd be here all night. And the only well, point that I really came here to make is that I don't think any field of science supports a global flood. At very best, the, the, the evidence that is proposed as support for a global flood can also be explained by conventional science. But conventional I science- I love science. I love yeah, science. Sure. But again, that's another thing you can't justify. You can't justify how you can do science, where the scientific method comes from, why you can have the uniformity of nature. That's why I'm going back to the living organisms. Abiogenesis has never been observed. It is a religious dogma by people who want to reject the God of the Bible. Now, if we're going to look at life, life could not evolve from a single-celled organism to get bigger, better, stronger, faster, smarter over time. We never see that. Um, mutations, especially in humans, mutations, we give 20 to 60 mutations per offspring. So a mutation is a copying error of the existing working information. So that doesn't give you new information. But now, that, that, still does, that still doesn't explain where the life came from or the information came from, so it could be buried in a flood. As a side note, I, I think that incorrectly characterizes what it is that conventional science thinks mutation and evolution does, because mutation and how natural selection acts upon it, it's completely context dependent. There isn't any ideal form within nature, at least not from the perspective of conventional science. You see what I mean? Which is why evolutionary theory predicted that we would have innumerable 
convoluted mechanisms within things as small as the cell to entire organ systems. And we do. We have things that don't seem to make sense. They, they appear to be tinkerings. Um, and the, I know the creationist explanation for this tends to involve genetic entropy, and that is also another conversation. I've talked that one to death as, as well. Um, but again, like I would love to have this conversation with you, Mr. Batman. It's just not the one I came here to have today. I, I'm, I'll, all I came to do is present why I think the flood didn't, not just didn't, couldn't happen. Okay. Um, and so, I'm, I'm, I'm here to present quite the opposite, that the God of the Bible is the one who created all time, space, and matter. He created us to be living, loving, logical beings because we're created in his image. He's eternal, universal, and unchanging. He's timeless, spacious, and immaterial. And he's a loving, living, logical, lawgiver God. See, I can explain all of these things to, via science. One, one sec. is we, we do to bring it back to the flood. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but the... Debating about induction is like a fine debate, but it's something that is like returning back to the flood topic. I do have to ask if we can do that. Sure. I'm happy to do that. But again, it comes back to where does that life come from in order to be buried? Evolution doesn't work. We've never observed it. Okay. You're using again, scientific we, laws. I do, have to, I do have to kind of redirect you back to the agreed upon topic, though. So how and about I'm, I'm, I'm thinking... I'm I'm thinking flood. Let's, as far as what I'm thinking, okay, here's, here's a good one. I want to see if you can solve, I mean, I guess it, it's, it's a, what I think is a problem and I'm curious as to how you would solve it. <laughs> um, so a while ago, a, a, a buddy of my, of mine and I got curious as to the, the, the case with the proboscidean. So for those of you who may not know, proboscideans, this is an order of animals and it contains modern elephants and their kin. So uh, it goes back to like barotherium or aerotherium, depending on, on what you want to go to. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what do we know about elephants? They're really, really big, so they require a lot of space. They eat a ton. They take forever to give birth. So I'm thinking to myself, you got four to four hundred years. How are you going to get all of the all of the types, all of the species of proboscidean that we have after the ark, and how many proboscideans were on the ark? So we decide to fool around and do some numbers, and uh, it turns out. If you take two proboscideans on the ark, so two kind of really basic, primitive-looking elephants. Um, you can have, once these two get off the ark, every single proboscidean be a different species than its parent, and you still don't have enough time to get all the species that we find in the fossil record. On the contrary, if you increase the number of kinds, so let's say you've got 15 kinds of proboscidean on the ark, you can't feed them all. And what I mean when I say that is, is very specific. We did some math and we said, okay, let's take the best case scenario for feeding elephants today right? We'll use juvenile elephants, we'll use their sleeping metabolic rate, and we'll use the highest quality feed, so it requires the least amount of space, alfalfa. And um, the food that would be required to feed 15 pairs of proboscideans for an entire year would take up 60% of the space on the ark, just the food alone. And that's not even considering the much larger animals that existed that required their juveniles, even if you're taking but, juveniles. But once again, that is a false dichotomy. What if God put them into a state of hibernation? You see, this is another option that we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. So again, uh, Noah and his family are on that ark. What happens if God simply puts all those animals into a state of hibernation? You no longer have the food issue. You no longer have the waste issue. Now, this is also a possibility. See, once again, you're setting up a straw man so you can set knock it down. The problem is you're still having to deal with uh, this type of elephant. Where did it come from? If you're going to say that there is an elephant and it was on the ark, great. I'm, I'm glad you say that. Let's go down that path. Where did the elephant come from? Where did the information inside the elephant come from? The DNA, the systems. So once again, we're back to the creation, the creation of the living forms themselves. And once again, I, I could come up with alternatives to everything you're saying, because, again, what you're trying to do is set up a false dichotomy that doesn't work when it comes to the scripture. I, I actually, believe it or not, I'm cool with the miracles. I don't have a single problem when I when I debate folks who, who are um, proponents of the global flood and they're like, you know what? Yeah, maybe there's a heat problem miracle or like yeah maybe god knocked all the animals out on the ark so that they wouldn't you know be awake or require as many nutrients or any nutrients for that matter 
Um, but but when that happens, I mean, again, it, it ceases to be science. It ceases to be able to, to be investigated by conventional means. And therefore, it's kind of outside my wheelhouse. Like, But it, wait a minute. It, Hang on just a second. Hang on a second. Science can only be done because of the God of the Bible. God set up the scientific laws, set laws of physics. Since he created laws of physics, he can set them aside at any time he so chooses. That's why they're called miracles. See, the fact of the matter is we're still left trying to figure out where the initial life came from so God could call these animals to the ark so they could actually get off the ark and reproduce. Now, you also mentioned the the uh, differences in the fossils of, of these procidians or types of elephants. The fact of the matter is there was only two elephants. That's all that God needed. Had all the genetic material necessary for those two elephants. Now, once again, the genetic information, where does that come from? Where did the living organisms come from? You you still have yet to justify where those things come from. Yeah, I, I just don't feel like I should because that's kind of not the conversation that, that we kind of like agreed to have. Were there I, not again, living organisms I, on the ark? Yeah, no, I listen, Great. I've I've had this conversation before, even here on Modern Day Debate. I'm happy to discuss abiogenesis or very early evolution around the Precambrian or Ediacaran, I guess you would say, into the Cambrian and the Silurian. I'm happy to discuss all of that. Um, but that's but just see, not the debate when, I can By here doing that, you're actually discussing your religion at that point. I don't because think so. this this is not science. You you can't go back and observe something that happened in the Precambrian. You can't go back and observe something that happened last Tuesday. Science happens in the here and now. It's observable, testable, repeatable. And we've never observed evolution. We've never observed an increase of information or complexity. Natural selection doesn't give it to you. Mutation doesn't give it to you. And you're still left trying to uh, figure out where life comes from and why it works the way it does. So I want I want to touch on something there briefly because I think I think there's a, a misunderstanding there as well. Um, and you you said you've done like science teaching and stuff like that, so I'm mm-hmm. sure you're aware of the scientific method and how that works. Um, yes, ma'am. And and one of the most important fields of science in our modern era, especially for those of us who are you know living in cities or things of that nature. Uh, is forensic science. Forensics is really important for things like solving crimes and finding out who done it and, you know, overall just just keeping us safe and solving mysteries and and giving people closure and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Forensics is, it's a one-to-one analogy for paleontology and what we do in paleontology. You're taking an event that you didn't witness and you're using the clues that you have at that crime scene or whatever, let's say, to formulate, yeah, to formulate a hypothesis and whether or not the person who's standing at the at the um, you know at the table in the courtroom is guilty or not depends on whether or not the predictions have, that have been made at that fe- or at that uh, crime scene pan out or not. So if someone comes up and they find the bloody hammer and they say, "I think this was the murder weapon," they test the blood. Mm-hmm. They find the blood also at the the suspect's house, and it also match- matches the blood of the victim. Well, that's a that's a if the glove prediction. doesn't fit, you must acquit. Yeah, you I must understand acquit. where you're going. Right. I'm, I yeah. understand where so, you're going so, with that. Yeah, so I'm saying we do science in the present day all the mm-hmm. time that we weren't there for, that we didn't but directly unfortunately, observe. you're looking at evidence in the here and now. Now, when we're talking about the evidence, you're talking about this bloody hammer or the bloody gloves. The, mm-hmm. the evidence that we're observing is the life. The life was on that arc. So now you've got um, you've got a, a bit of evidence here that you've yet to justify how that evidence got there. You're, if you're going to use paleontology or forensics, okay, great, let's go down that path. How did that information get there? How did that life get there? How did those systems get there inside those organisms yeah, so they the, could be buried in the flood? The, the thing about now, that, though, Now we're using paleontology. Yeah, the thing about that, though, Mr. Batman, is where that gets you to is it gets you to maybe like uh, the Archean period, and it gets you to like... Um, a, a, a God, the tinkerer within evolution, because there no. have been, it, it does because every single year, and this is within medicine, paleontology, agriculture, evolutionary theory predicts and accurately comes to fruition in ways that help our society. You can call it microevolution, but I included paleontology for a reason mm-hmm. because paleontologists also make predictions using evolutionary theory, and they find critters where they predicted that they would find them using yes. specific that's evolutionary predictions. Actually, so, so that's honestly, speciation. It's real, quick, it's real quick on that. What I want to say on that mm-hmm. is that 
the reason why what you were just talking about gets you to gets you far back in time, it doesn't take you to, to uh, abiogenesis, right? That's first of all, that's not really the realm of paleontology in the first place. Um, but with the number of verifiable predictions that again have come to fruition within paleontology and adjacent fields, that's that's going to be evolution all the way. Flood geology doesn't make those predictions. Actually, once again, you're making an appeal to the scientific method that you cannot justify. You've got the evidence of living organisms on the ark that were buried because God judged the world with a flood. He actually did so because of the sin of mankind to actually preserve the, the, the bloodline of Noah and his family so the Messiah could come. Now, all of these things you've yet to justify. Now, when I talk about life and you begin to talk about evolution, evolution has never been observed. And when you're talking about this predictions, well, yeah, we can make predictions based on the loss of information that happens during evolution. Evolution is always a loss of information. It's never an increase of information. You can That's have insertion, true, you can have an insertion, you can have a deletion, or you can have a duplication. But those are always a loss of functionality. When when you have a mutation, a mutation is a copying error of the existing working information. So once you have a mutation, now you have less information and less functionality. That's why we have, again, you mentioned genetic entropy. I, I love genetic ent entropy because these things go downhill all the time. But we still, before we go even go downhill, we have to decide how that life got there to begin with which you've not done, how you can do the scientific method, which you've not done, how these things have multiple systems that are irreducibly complex, how did they come about, which you've not done. These are designed to work in a specific way. The, every single system is pragmatic. The circulatory system has three basic parts, the heart, the blood, and the veins and the arteries. Now, wait a minute. That is an irreducibly complex system that is interdependent upon other irreducibly complex systems like the circular, or excuse me, like the respiratory system, like the muscular system, like the skeletal system. Once again, where do all those things come from? We so do, they could be we do on the ark and trying to oh, redirect back to the flood. I, I'm, I'm actually on the ark. I'm back on the ark again. So they could be on the ark and so they could be buried. This is why I started with creation. In oh, order America, to have something to be points. buried, it had to be created first. No, that's okay. And there, there are a lot of points, but but honestly, I think a lot of them can can be covered decently quickly. Again, as far as the scientific method goes, I, I mean, I'm the one that to to be a little bit sassy, I guess. I feel like I'm the one that's brought that to the table because I'm talking about validated predictions <laughs> that have been done by evolutionary theory. Flood geology mm -hmm. doesn't do that. People take evolutionary theory as a framework, and they say, you know, the classic example people use is Neil Shubin in finding uh, Tiktaalik. He said, okay. If evolutionary theory is correct, we should find an organism that looks like this, approximately between an organism like Eusthenopteron and, and something like um, uh, Canthostega. Um, and we should find it in this strata because this strata would look like this at this time, this marshland on the coast, et cetera, et cetera. They find out where that is. It was up in Greenland. They go and dig. They find nothing. They dig again. They find nothing. They dig a third time and they find Tiktaalik. It's a validated prediction specifically tailored to evolution. So that that's the scientific method in action, baby. That's that's as bold as it gets, as clear cut as it gets. And that's why I keep saying, you know, these evolutionary predictions, you know, originally they would take us back a couple million years, and then it was a couple of hundred million years. And people are making predictions, you know, within the Cambrian, within the Silurian, they're making them within the Permian, within the Cretaceous, all throughout. And they're using it, using things like radiometric dating and evolutionary theory, theory et cetera. Now, if you want to say you don't have abiogenesis cracked, I agree. I don't think it's cracked. But again, that only gets you to abiogenesis. That gets you to a tinkerer god who uses evolution to get organisms to where they are today. No, As a last no, point on that, just really quick, because we're, we're you mentioned quite a bit there. With regard to making new information, there's a classic example that I like to bring up with this. Everybody knows it. It's, it's the ice fish mutation. I don't know, maybe you've heard of it. Um, and while you're correct that usually copying errors are responsible even for beneficial mutations because mutations are context dependent, right? So what seems to be an error may in the end be something that's quite helpful. In real life, the example of this is, is Viagra, right? This was something that is used for erectile dysfunction, but the original medication was for blood pressure. So it was a mistake that ended up doing something beneficial. That's, that's the bread and butter of evolution. That's all it is. And in the case of the ice fish, they mute, they, they, there was a mutation that occurred that gave a de novo out of nothing, right? 
protein that allows them to keep their blood flowing and moving despite basically swimming in freezing temperatures. It came out of nowhere. We know the population that these ice fish came from. They don't have it. But the ones that we see now swimming up in, in more um, northerly waters, they do have it. We took the ice fish, we looked at the genome, we found the specific gene that was doing this. And we saw that it came out of nowhere, de novo. That's why it's called de novo. And all it was, was like you said, a copying error within some proteins. But that copying error was a beneficial mutation mm -hmm. because of the context. Um, exactly. And that's, that's, that's all evolution is. That's all it's ever been. Yes. But unfortunately, evolution requires information. You're still appealing to specified complex arrangement of symbols and these symbols, this symbolic relationship of the G, T, A, and C, especially in our genome, that actually provide, uh, pro excuse me, um, convey a message or provide a function in our genetic code. You can't justify that. Once again, these all these things are living organisms that are irreducibly complex. You have a fish that actually had some type of mutation that was a copying error. Well, where did the first self-replicating system come from? Not so you can topic. have. Okay, I antagonized that. I antagonized that one, James. I I was continuing on it. Sorry. <laughs> Any last well, thoughts with regard to the arc in particular, or I should say the flood in particular? Well, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and say the last thing I'll say about it is again, yeah, sure. when we see, when we see the flood, when we see the evidence of the flood, we see the Grand Canyon, we see all this different erosion uh, places like the Grand Canyon all over our planet. Uh, we see fossils all over our planet, billions of dead things laid down by sedimentary layers of rock water all over our planet. Uh, again, these things were once alive and now they're dead. They have irreducibly complex systems that my opponent has not justified. She's using the scientific method, which she has not justified. And, and again, she, she has a faith. She has a faith that I don't have. I don't have the faith that she has, that these things can happen this way because we've never observed it. So that's my last statement. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to Erica. If you have anything to say, Erica, before we go into Q&A, folks. Yeah, I, I had a really good time. I enjoyed the conversation. It was cordial. It, it was fun. I think that we, but it was a respectful chat. I, in the same vein that Mr. Batman was saying just now, I feel like I didn't get any answers to my questions, but I honestly don't fault him for that because the, the professional creationist can't answer those questions either. That's why I ask them. That's why I always ask them because it's like, I'm, I'm very interested. Maybe someone's thought of something that they haven't. Uh, that would be really cool if, if, if someone, you know, had, had kind of sussed out this solution to the heat problem or come up with a cool new way of, of, um, of sorting the organisms. Um, and, and that's, that's what I'm after. I'm just after, after truth. And yes, I'm, I'm really interested in evolutionary theory. I think it's cool. Uh, but it also, it honestly just stems for, for a love of the natural world. I find it very fascinating and I think I always will. And, um, yeah, I had a really good time. You got it. Well, thank you very much. And we're going to jump into those questions, folks. Want to say, folks, if you have not heard, if you have been living on Mars in a cave with your fingers in your ears, you guys, we are absolutely pumped. RN Ra will be back this coming Tuesday, taking on Dr. Andrew Jackson, in particular on the topic of what is the most recent common ancestor of monkeys and humans. You don't want to miss it, folks. So hit that subscribe button as well as that oh notification <laughs> bell as well. It's going to be juicy, folks. Folks, believe me, very juicy. This one coming in from Brute Facts Podcast. Thanks so much. Says, I made Mr. Batman rage quit in our Discord. One of your buddies, Mr. Batman? <laughs> Next up. No, I have no idea who that is. Now, a lot of times people get me into the Discord channel, and then they get all vulgar. And then, yes, I do leave. Uh, but I, I've never rage quit because I've lost a debate. You got it in. This one from Big Thing Bruce Wayne says, Ken... Ham's Ark is made with concrete and steel and has flood insurance. Where's the faith? <laughs> is this true? It actually I mean, it does. It does. I, have you been there? I, I have. Yeah. I've been I, there four times. I've I actually feeling. taken my Bible study group and things like that. Yes. The, the, strut, the struts down at the bottom are uh, concrete. They actually have big metal bolts that are holding it too. But get, but again, this is a part of our building codes for today as well. Uh, so you have to take into consideration, you just can't go out and build any structure you like any way you like. You have to do it according to the state standards. 
I I actually um, I'm doing a long editing, a long video about my trip there because there's there's a lot to talk about. But I I had a great time at the Ark Encounter with my mom and we we saw it. And it, it really is an impressive structure. It's much cooler yeah. from the front, from the back. It's there, as Mr. Batman said, it it looks much more like a building. Um, yeah, I I enjoyed it. I I'm kind of trying not to spoil my video though. There's a lot to talk about. So. Juicy. And reminder, folks, our guests are linked in the description. This question from Stephen Michael says, Erica, do you sincerely believe in macro evolution? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I study primates. So my specialty is, of course, in, in primate evolution, um, how primates change from, from one morphology to another, how they do so through time. And that includes human evolution as well. I, I find that to be a very, a very cool and personal field of study. And that's, I have some skulls behind me. I think skulls are cool. I think bones are cool. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really do. I, if you'd like to discuss more about it, you can always shoot me an email uh, or check out my videos. I talk a lot about human evolution on my channel. <laughs> You got it. Thank you very much for this question coming in from Bubblegum Gun says, what about the termites though? Also, Satan does not equal the devil. Uh? I think they're saying, <laughs> wouldn't the Ark have been destroyed by termites if you brought termites onto the Ark? Uh, I well, happen and... to know the lore on that. Ken Ham has a, he, the Ark encounter tackles that, the, the, the lore covers it. Um, it. Mr. Batman, I believe you, the question was for you. I'm taking your question. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Well, and again, uh, not all creeping creatures had to be brought on. Some of them could have actually been uh, left off the ark. I wish that one would have been along with mosquitoes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, we don't know exactly what gopher wood was, and everything on the inside of the ark was covered in pitch as well. Plus, these things would have, again, if they were in a hibernated state, wouldn't have been an issue, or if they'd been contained in a particular container, once they came on the ark, again, wouldn't have been an issue. Got it. Erica, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, whether they brought them or didn't, um, whether the, the creation model holds that they brought them or didn't, uh, I'm much more interested in what's going on outside the Ark anyway. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, you know, because there are so many different kinds of arthropods that you couldn't, at least as far as I am aware, um, progen uh, uh, progenate, I guess you would say, from, from two individuals just because of how their genetics works. So like a lot of hymenopterans are organized like that where the, the females are diploid and the males are haploid. Um, so you, you get into some interesting, what I would perceive as problems with that. And I know they propose like floating forests and stuff. The floating forests are another huge thing to, that we could talk about. Um, I don't think they work either, but um, it's an interesting question. You got it, juicy. And this one coming in from the butcher says, why would God not just poof the animals all back well uh because it was a judgment it was showing that god is going to judge everything in the world including the animals now it also shows us something very specific that there are two types of animals that god allowed on the ark see people just think well noah brought them on two by two nope he brought two of the unclean animals and seven of the clean animals. So even before the, the covenant was given at Mount Sinai, Noah knew about clean and unclean animals, and he sacrificed some of the clean animals when he got off the ark. Because, see, if you'd only brought two of every animal, the minute you got hungry and God said, all this stuff you can eat now, guess what? You eat one of them, you just killed them off. You got it, and thank you very much for this question. Tyler Cates, appreciate it, said, how did the polar bears stay warm enough in the cold, and how did the lizards uh, stay in their right temperature in the heat in the desert? Um, well, that's also... Oh, go ahead. I think... No, I just... I don't... I, if that's for you, take it. I just wasn't sure if it was for me or you. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, depending on what uh, original pair of bears would have been brought on would it have been a polar bear would it have been a combination of polar bear brown bear black bear whatever it might have been whatever bear it was that original bear kind would have had all the genetic material necessary for it to survive in every particular environment that they go in so once again that wouldn't have been an issue when it comes down to uh the reptiles the reptiles again probably depending on the temperature would have gone into a state of hibernation you got it, and thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Andrew Kroll, good to see you, says Mr. Batman. Seriously, who or what fed the mosquitoes on the ark? Well, I personally believe uh, that the mosquitoes 
may not have been on the ark. There might have been larvae someplace else. I don't like mosquitoes, so I'm just was hoping they wouldn't be on the ark. But if they were on the ark, OK, then again, they probably would have also been in a state of hibernation because they would have been sucking on blood and we wouldn't have want that on the ark now, would we? Mm -mm. Robert Pollock, thanks for your question, said Mr. Batman. Are you a licensed teacher in which state? Well, I am a teacher and I'm in the state of Indiana. Uh, I teach Bible. I teach um, speech. I also teach debate. Um, I'm also currently teaching social studies and world geography. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Ian Chen says, did the Ark have floodlights? Next up, thanks for your question. This one coming in from two seconds. Got a little glitch here. Bubblegum Gun says, Batman admitted the laws of physics are social constructs. Did you admit that, Mr. Batman? No, sir, I didn't. Because we didn't come up with the laws of physics. The laws of physics were created by a lawgiver God who doesn't change over time. Because these laws don't change over time. Once God changes something, like the law of biology, when he allowed uh, Jesus to be conceived inside Mary's womb miraculously, like when uh, the a nation of Israel was wandering in the desert for 40 years and their clothes didn't d disintegrate and their shoes didn't fall apart. Uh, these are, again, different laws that God can change or set aside miraculously. So when Jesus raised people from the dead or healed people from le leprosy, he has the ability to uh, change those natural laws as he needs to be. Those are miraculous. But there are certain natural laws that God cannot change. God cannot violate the laws of logic. Because they are his very attributes, the laws of identity, non-contradiction, excludable laws of mathematics. These are how God's mind thinks. They are eternal, universal, and unchanging. And because they are his attributes, he cannot change those. God cannot create a one-ended stick, a square circle, a married bachelor, military intelligence. Those things just don't exist. You got it in. Thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Ian Chen says, there's no ark because it's Noah to be found. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and answer that one real quick. I know why it's <laughs> Noah to be found. See, people say, oh, we found the ark on Mount Ararat. No, you wouldn't have found the ark on Mount Ararat. Think about this. When the ark landed, there probably would have been a whole lot of greenery, grasses, uh, some bushes. The uh, dove came back with an olive branch in its beak. So, But again, there wouldn't have been any mature trees. So what would you have built your shelter out of, your pens for your animals? What would you built those out of? You would have had to cannibalize that ark. Every bit of wood would have been used for some purpose until you had mature trees grown up enough to where you had, you can harvest those to build whatever you needed to build. You got it. And thank you very much for this question coming in from John Makovec says, so God can change the natural laws wherever he wants and hide all the, all evidence of that. How convenient, Mr. Batman. Well, God is God. And you know what the Bible says? I'm going to quote the scripture. God can do anything he chooses in the heavens and on the earth. There you go. You got it, and Thank you very much for this one. Big thing, Bruce Wayne says, if the Christian flood wiped out the world, how did other civilizations exist before and after the flood? Also, why did several civs record uh, civilizations record no flood well actually you have pretty much a flood narrative in nearly every civilization out there not all of them but quite a few uh the epic of gilgamesh happens to be one of them um in uh, i think it's in china i can't remember which one when you look at their particular pictographic language the uh actual uh pictograph for boat is literally a, a box looking thing with eight slashes on it, the eight people on the ark. So it's very interesting like that. Now, there were no civilizations after, or excuse me, during that flood period. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we look at the, uh, the evidence of written language, when did the written language start to occur? About 4,000 years ago, about 500 years after the ark event, the, no, the flood event. You Can know. I add one thing to that? If, is sure. that okay? Because I'm sure. not getting any questions. <laughs> no one ever <laughs> asks me any questions. I never get any questions, and I'm so bitter about it. <laughs> so I'll poach Mr. Batman's questions. Please. Um, I I want to. I'm going to push back a little on the on the prevailing flood narrative, just because I think, um, or the flood narrative being so ubiquitous. Because it, while it is true, there are a lot of flood narratives, especially in civilizations that lived uh, near water that frequently underwent things like inundations. 
Um, I would like to point out that there are a lot of archetypes that are very common in, in, um, in human uh, sort of record keeping or mythos, whichever one you want to go with shapeshifter deities and, um, and trickster gods and, uh, you know, angels. And um, I guess you would say it like a hybridized creatures, you know, where they've got animal body parts. I mean, that's like a classic from Egyptian mythology to Roman Greek mythology. mythology as well. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't necessarily know that that would stand on its own. I think it's interesting, um, but I don't think it necessarily supports the global flood. That's just that's my opinion. Well, I would also point out that the Greek mythology, um, like the Minotaur, the half bull, half man, mm. this is what the Nephilim were doing, also referenced in the scripture. They were actually engaging in genetic splicing. Uh, this is called mixture. God hates that mixture. One more reason he judged the entire world with the flood. You got it, and Thank you very much. Oliver Catwell has a message. We really want to share this. Really important. We do appreciate it. Oliver says, remembering the Capitol officers who took their own lives, 1-800-SUICIDE is a free anonymous helpline mm. if you are contemplating suicide. So, folks, we really do want you to, I had pinned that at the top of the chat, and we absolutely do encourage you, if you are contemplating suicide, please do call that number. Please <laughs> do get help from a professional, and our hearts go out to you. We're, we're glad you're here, folks, as a, as a side note. No matter what walk of life you are from, whether you be Christian, atheist, black, white, Republican, Democrat, gay, straight, you name it. We are really glad you are here. We hope you feel welcome. And so, again, that number is pinned at the top of the chat. And so please do, if, uh, if you are contemplating suicide, call that number. And we will jump into the next question from Big Thang Bruce Wayne says, If the Christian flood wiped out the world, Mr. Batman... Oh, we got that one. Sorry about that. Experiments in prebiotic chemistry says, Awesome job debating. Erica, huge fan you got here, Erica, says, Thanks for being here to debate this. I am always happy to come in and have a chat. This I, I really do enjoy this topic. That's the thing. You know, some people, some of my colleagues are like, why are you, why are you going around talking about this stuff all the time? <laughs> I think it's interesting. I think it's fun. <laughs> that really is the reason. And, you know, I want to stress too that like, supposing just because I've been burned before, supposing that it's on like a neutral platform, I'm happy to, to debate anybody on this. I really am. I, I, I love it. Uh, that's why I usually come on Modern Day Debate. Although there, James, I did I did cheat on the channel a little bit. There's a there's a channel out there called Theology Unleashed, and I had the pleasure of uh, debating intelligent design advocate Gunter Beckley over there a couple of months ago, and it was it was really fun. That's so, I'm sorry, awesome. James. I know, I know. <laughs> hey, it's that's, put me in the brig. That's funny. No, we're excited for it. If you feel free, if you ever have a, a, a debate, call use our handle in the tweet. And we are happy to retweet it because that sounds epic. And we would love for people uh, to mutual to shilling. I like it. We'd love for people to decide wherever they want to watch debates. We're happy for them to watch it wherever they do. And Mac, the Huffman human, Mac, the human. So sorry. He says the real Batman would have investigated this, not just assert, quote, the Joker did it, unquote. This Batman isn't for real. Oh, well, I got news for him. I'm the Batman who laughs. <laughs> you know what? No. What really gets me no. is I have investigated this. I've been looking at this for 35 years, almost 40 years now. Um, I actually was an atheist and brought to this position of creationism because of a gentleman that I love very dearly, my uncle, who just barely had a sixth grade education. But he asked me some very basic questions about life, about how life works. And you know what? I said, oh, man, I'm going to prove you wrong. And that's why I am here today, because I wanted to know the truth. And I, I appreciate Ms. Erica saying she's a truth seeker, because I am too. I want to know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth. You got it. And thank you very much for this question from Ian Chen. says, Noah kept the bees in the ark hives. <laughs> Oh, Man, he's coming joke. out with so many winners tonight. <laughs> Miss, you're cracking up Mr. <laughs> Batman. Mr. Batman loves these. Bubblegum Gun says, Nephilim Free wants to debate me. Ask him for a 1v1. Uh, maybe. And then next up, thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from Raw Nakedness says, If you compare Mesohippus with a modern horse and consider that there are descriptions of modern horses from 1,000 years after the flood, you would have to believe in a lot of super fast evolution. Mm. Mm, not necessarily. Once again, when you have all the different genetic material that you need for any particular animal, 
um, again, God designed that into the system. Um, if you're going to say that, well, wait a minute, this didn't work this way, then you're denying the truth of God's word. Um, Psalm 119, verse 160, the sum of your word is truth and all of your righteous rulings endure forever. God's word is truth. If we may not understand it completely, that doesn't negate the truth factor of it. You got it in. Thank you very much for this question. Coming in from experiments in prebiotic chemistry strikes again saying, how do we know that the Christian God gives us the uniformity of nature? The Bible says so. Um, actually, that would be one. But unfortunately, if you're going to look in a, a philosophy book, the actual definition of a circular argument is the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true. That's circular. But wait a minute. Let's look at the evidence. In order to have time, space, and matter, by definition, you must have a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, living, logical, lawgiver, most high Elohim. That's the God of the Bible. And that's just looking at time, space, and matter. You got it, and. Thank you very much for this question coming in from Raw Nakedness says, at one dino graveyard, bones show signs of weathering. After death, they decomposed and the bones degraded by exposure to the elements, probably for years in most cases. That might be DNM or it might be the Cleveland dinosaur quarry. I, I can't remember. They're, they're, I don't know. I, that wasn't at me, but I'm just, I was trying to pick out Rock and Raw Nakedness. Tell me in the chat which one you're talking about. I'm curious. I'm just, I'm very curious. Talking to me? Well. No, I was talking to Ron Nakedness. Sorry, James. No. Well, and what with my issue is that's not a problem. Um, yes, there could be some bones that were left above the, uh, uh, the last strata, the last flood strata that was brought down. That's not an issue. The, the issue is, okay, these things were once alive and now they're dead. And we see them all over our planet. Billions of dead things laid down by sedimentary layers of rock all over our planet. How did they get here? Uh, Miss Erica had mentioned falling into a well or into the tar pits. These, those are very rare occurrences. But we see a common event all over the planet. What happened? It was a global catastrophic flood. You got it, Ann. Thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Tyler Cates. Appreciate it. it says, Mr. Batman, please explain how the heart is irreducibly complex. It's made of cells and can be broken into valves. If a valve goes, the heart still functions. Oh, actually, the heart itself is a four chamber pump made of meat. It's part of an irreducibly complex system. Now, if one of those valves start to malfunction, your body's not going to function very well. But the system itself, I happen to know a little bit about this because I've had a couple of heart attacks. I don't recommend those for anybody. But once again, well, um, the, the heart is irreducibly complex in its own right because it has a number of different parts that actually make it work, make it pump to the tune of 700,000 gallons a year without stopping. Because if it ever stops, you got a problem. But in order for that to be there, you have to have the blood. The blood pulls in the oxygen, takes out the carbon dioxide. Then in order for that to work, you have to have the veins and the arteries. Now, blood itself is irreducibly complex. Uh, the veins and the arteries are all through your body. And all this is interdependent upon the respiratory system and also the muscular system. So the systems themselves are interdependent upon one another. If you don't have all of them functioning simultaneously, then you don't have a functioning human being. You don't have a functioning system. I think if I may add on that, the irreducible complexity stuff is is really fun to talk about, I think, just because it always sends me down a rabbit hole of like, okay, well, what do we really know about, you know, given organ system, whether it's discussing something like the circulatory system, um, the, the, um, the nervous system, the complexity of the eye is another classic one that tends to be to be looked at. And from from the sort of evolutionary perspective on this, although this is like the the real fast and loose version um, you tend to want to look at in order to find out if something is truly irreducibly complex to see if you can if you can map out this this trajectory from something from extant extant organisms. So the classic is the eye, right? You've got eye spots and flatworms, and proceedingly more complex eyes in other extant species from pinhole camera eyes seen in, in the likes of like octopuses, uh, cup eyes in some kinds of fish, uh, to the to the complex eye that's seen in mammals. 
And so then the question is, okay, well, genetically, can you get from, you know, A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, uh, without like lethality? And the quest, the answer to that question is really fascinating for every organ system that's been looked at. Um, there, there tends to be a very logical pathway to take that isn't that, that isn't lethal in and of itself, and in fact confers fitness benefits at every step along the way. So I would argue that when it comes to irreducible complexity, if, if, you, if we were to ever have a conversation about that, it, I think the name of the game would be like, okay, we're only gonna talk about this system because there's so much to talk about with each one, um, but it sure is cool. <laughs> I would agree with that, because when I had my debate with R and Ra, which uh, lasted a grand total of 25 minutes because he couldn't answer the questions I was asking him. I asked him very specifically, okay, this system is irreducibly complex, the heart, the blood, and the veins and the arteries. Which one of them evolved first? And you know what he said? Well, the funny thing is, is the heartbeat evolved first. Wait a minute. How do you evolve a heartbeat without an, a, a physical transmitter, something that's actually going to transmit that electric signal? So once again, we, we understand that we all these systems had to be in place. Next up, Fat Man, thank you for your super chat. No question, I just see it says. But Mr. Morpheus, thanks for your thank question. You, Batman. Mr. Batman, you kept saying we haven't observed evolution happening. Tell me when have you observed a God creating anything? Oh, um, we haven't observed God creating anything because that would violate the first law of thermodynamics, that matter and energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but it can only change form over time. The fact of the matter is this in tandem with the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, that uh, all things go from a state of order to disorder, from workable usable energy to no workable usable energy, also known as thermal equilibrium, this proves that a, an agent, a personal loving agent, chose to begin his act of creation and then chose to stop his act of creation. Because if all you ever have is an eternal cause, the only thing you could have is an eternal effect. Now, that God designed all the multiplicity of systems that we have. You see, in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 20, it says, for what can be known about God is plain to them. Who's them? Everybody. Because God has shown it to them. Namely, his eternal power, his divine nature, his invisible attributes have been clearly seen, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in everything that has been made so that nobody has an excuse. That's why I asked about natural laws. That's why I asked about laws of logic. That's why I asked what, where the source of life comes from, because you cannot justify them without a loving, living, logical lawgiver God. Tyler West, thanks for your question, says, where is the flood boundary? Where does it begin and where does it end? It should be the most obvious boundary of layered bedding in the rock layers. It doesn't exist, and Mr. Batman has no explanation. Oh, my goodness. Well, actually, if you look at the Earth, it has what uh, is called a seam all the way around it. Personally, and again, we don't know for sure because we weren't there, and the Bible doesn't tell us. But part of that seam, those fault lines, start in Jerusalem. Wow, that's pretty cool. So I, pr I think that started right there. Now, how are you going to have flood boundaries when the entire world is covered by the flood? Where, you're going to, where are your boundaries going to be at that point? The highest mountain was covered by at least 20 feet. So the question is kind of moot right there anyway. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this question. Do appreciate it. Coming in from Ron Nakedness says, you don't really need a heart for a circulatory system. You just need directional flow. You can get that from cilia or muscle action. Great. Now, who designed the muscle action to work that way? Wouldn't the heart be considered muscle action? So right there, you're saying you can have a circulatory system without a heart, but now you're just going to calling the muscle action, which does the same function as the heart. You're just going to appeal to that. You're still left asking the question, what caused it to be there? What caused the template to be there so the next generation could have that same functional system? Gotcha. And thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Tasha Thomas says, only local, parentheses, farm animals were taken into the ark. We have the proof of the global flood. Get the evidence from the video, quote, one, two, three, four, five, proof for God, unquote. Uh, so is that for me? I think that was, um, 
a troll. And then Spring Heel <laughs> Jack, thanks for your question, says, but Erica, or Erica is so hungry for a question. But don't I'm worry. I'm starving we've, over here, James. Throw me a bone. We've got you one. Spring Heel Jack says, <laughs> Erica, is it possible that human population groups in isolation from one another evolved to have different cognitive abilities? Um, I think given the level of admixture that we've seen in humans, um, no, I think that, that as far as pinning certain, certain groups, like all that IQ stuff with, with different individual uh, populations, I don't think that pans out at all in the genetic work that we've seen. Um, humans are all remarkably similar to one another. We, we are not a species with very much genetic diversity when compared to, uh, other animals, although many primates have low genetic diversity simply because they're prone to bottlenecks. Um, but no, I, I don't think that there is any kind of, uh, could, could that feasibly happen? I think that species wise, it did. Homo sapiens is just all one large group with, with a, a cognition that's effectively the same. Um, and that cognition was selected for over, uh, perhaps the more robust Homo neanderthalensis, uh, Homo naledi, uh, all these other contemporaneous hominins, um, Homo floresiensis, same boat. Denisovan, same boat. Uh, brain beat brawn out on that one. Juicy. By the way, as a side note, Erica, in your experience in the education that you've received on these topics, have you ever heard of the stigma against group evolution? You could say kind of group level evolution via, or I should say, rather than individual level selection seems to be totally accepted. But group yeah. level selection is considered like, Ugh. If you mean, if you're meaning sort of like along the lines of like, um, like the evolution of, of you sociality, because that tends to be like, that tends to be a real tricky subject, <laughs> like that evolving that level of cooperation. It, it seems pretty unpopular right now, if that is what they're talking about. What I'm thinking of is when you say you sociality, do you mean like groups that are pro-social that cooperate more than other groups would be more likely to pass on their genes because they'll out-compete other groups that aren't cooperating with oh no 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 yeah that as far as that goes like like sociality is a huge game changer the ability to cooperate is is one of our biggest strengths we see this constantly in other apes too in given populations of like chimpanzees for instance chimpanzees who are excellent at doing these these territorial raids with high levels of cooperation are capable of monopolizing resources in bonobos who are very closely related to chimps but they're matriarchal so they're led by an alpha female females who individually are weaker than males form coalitions with one another to bully males out of feeding rights so this idea of being able to cooperate to get what you want it's huge. And the, the thinking goes is that sociality goes hand in hand with cognition. Every big brain species on the planet is highly social from cetaceans to, uh, to our, our elephants, to humans, to, to corvids, to other apes. I mean, that's just, that's, that's how it goes. So I, I would say that the evolving, the ability to cooperate, man, that was one of the best moves in the history of moves. Humoring Erica for just one more second, Mr. Batman, because I know you're waiting. But sure. he's throwing me a bone here. Yeah, you're just giving me what I want, James. You're humoring me. <laughs> well, what I one thing that it was interesting that I ran into when I went to, I, this is a philosophy of science course that I took getting my master's in philosophy at Texas Tech. One of the things that came up in that course was the extreme skepticism regarding group selection. So in other words, even though it seems intuitive, like I think it seems intuitive that, for example, even today, if you have, uh, let's say it's kind of like in the Olympics almost, like as an analogy, if you have one team that cooperates better than another, oh, it'll yeah. probably be more likely to win or more likely to survive out there in the world. However, well, this is, I'm reading this from, I remember Dawkins is actually a huge critic or skeptic. He says, uh, so I'm reading this now. It says, Richard Dawkins and other advocates of the gene-centered view of evolution remain unconvinced about group selection. So in other yeah, words, but, have you heard but, of, but one thing I'm just asking, have you, I want to, and I'm not saying this as a, as a means of like trying to sow seeds of division among people who <laughs> believe in evolution. My, the reason I'm bringing this up is like, it, did you ever experience that or, or hear about the fact that for a lot of biologists, group level selection is like 
they would say like, oh, that's like creationism. Like it, it's that much, it's that stigmatized to where they would, have you ever heard of that being that stigmatized? I, I mean, potentially, I, I think maybe I've been, I've been thinking along a different line here as far as what it is that we're actually talking about. I mean, e, e, the, the concept of cooperation is inherent to social animals. I can't imagine that, that any biologist in their right mind would, would deny that. I don't even think Dawkins would do that. And there are things that I disagree with, with Dawkins on for sure. Um, although he's a decent evolutionary biologist, I think he's better with, um, with science communication in my opinion. Um, but, th but that being said, like the, the, the idea that a gene that you can abide by the selfish gene theory, and then also have group level selection, at least if I'm imagining this correctly, um, I, I don't understand why that's not going to be coherent, at least if I'm thinking of the same thing that you guys are thinking of. I, so that's, again, it's the name of the game with, with social species. Um, and I, again, I can't think of, I can't think of anybody who would be studying social mammals, social, you know, birds, anything of that nature who, who would deny that. In fact, I would argue that pro-sociality is huge for promoting the selfish gene. I mean, those, those two things can, can, exist in tandem and support one another as well as hypotheses Juice. um but maybe that's me being controversial i don't know well we will talk more about it but patrick uh, lowinger am i pronouncing it right let me know patrick says check out amy newman's youtube recent episode flood mythologies of the ancient mediterranean and mesopotamia juicy thanks for that patrick and spring hill jack oh we got that one snake is Snake was right, past tense. Good to see you. I didn't see your question, though. Ferenc Alice, thanks for your question. Said says, wet-nosed primates can produce their own vitamin C. Dry-nosed primates can't. So we, so were there primates with scurvy on board the Ark, Mr. Batman? No, there wouldn't have been any uh, animals that had any problems whatsoever. Because once again, God would have only brought the animals with the perfect genetic structure to, to actually perform uh, the functions that they needed to do in order to have those descendants when they actually got off the ark. You got it. And thank you very much for this question. Tyler West says, Erica, can you explain why the Dover Cliffs made of chalk limestone cannot form in a flood or in 6,000 years? Um, yes. So in the case of the cliffs of Dover, that's that's mostly going to be chalk. And uh, the, the conditions that are conducive <clears throat> for limestone formation and chalk formation at that, they're warm waters that are calm in order to be uh, turbulence and turbidity and things like that will remix the the um, the minerals and and um, uh, and substances and such like that back into the water. So you, and then you also have to have low acidity because if the acidity is too high, again, it breaks down the mineral and you have to have low pressure. All four of these things aren't going to be, at least as far as I am aware, um, the types, the types of conditions that you're going to see in a global flood. Uh, to make matters worse, I would propose chalk and limestone are composed, marine chalk and limestone, I should be very clear. Chemical is different. Chemical limestone is a different thing, but they are readily distinguishable from one another. So close to Dover, it's a marine kind of kind of deposition, accumulation, deposition, et cetera, um, uh, marine structure. And you know this because you can take little pieces off, look at it underneath the microscope, and you see little microorganism shells, things of that nature. So you also, the, another reason why I would propose that the, that the flood couldn't do it is because maintaining a community of, of uh, planktonic life to create something like the Cliffs of Dover, it, it couldn't happen in, in a year. If you had all those organisms living contemporaneously in one spot at the same time, it's a sludge of microorganisms, uh, which is why a vast amount of time is, in my opinion, required for something like this, because these organisms are living and dying and depositing. They're living, they're dying, depositing. They're living, they're dying, depositing. But doing it all at once, and I mean, it's, we're, we're looking at like the, the, um, the amoebic sea from uh, uh, Alien Planet, that <laughs> Discovery Channel documentary from uh, a couple decades ago. You got it. And this one from Bubblegum Gun, I can't tell if they're serious, says laws given by a god is no different in social construct from a law given by a communist government. Laws above God must come from a higher being. Man, Actually, no, that doesn't work because you have to have laws that come from an eternal, universal, and unchanging lawgiver. If you're going to have laws of physics, laws of chemistry, laws of biology, laws of logic, laws of mathematics. Now, 
Um, when you're talking about laws that man makes, you're talking about conventions, conventional laws. Man can change those laws anytime he wants. That's like a speed limit. Um, my dog is about to go crazy, so I got to let her out. I'll be right back. No worries. You've got a question for Now Erica. you've got an opportunity to ask a question to Miss Erica. That's Finally. Right. <laughs> Sunflower, right thanks for your question, says, for Erica, do you consider scientific truth with a capital T to be the most important thing to pursue and spread? Um, I think it's important that some people do take that position. I think that having very uh, science-focused minds in our society is a lot of times what leads to innovation that makes society better. I don't think it's necessarily that every necessary, rather that everyone has that kind of perspective. I would like it just because I like to think that I have that perspective, at least to a degree. Uh, but I don't think that that is necessarily the most important thing, like TM period, full stop. Gotcha. And the next one, Mr. Morpheus says, Mr. Batman, you didn't, you don't get to assert a God did this or that. You have to prove it. The Bible's the claim, not the proof. Well, actually, the Bible is the foundation for truth. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then I just quoted Psalm 119, verse 160 earlier, that the sum of his word is truth. But I also validated that with the evidence of creation. Since we know that whatever created time, space, and matter did not need time, space, and matter in order to create time, space, and matter, that being or thing, wherever you want to look at it that way, had to be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. All-powerful, all-knowing, loving, living, a personal agent, and a logical lawgiver. So that is only the God of the Bible. That's the only one ex that exists. You got it, and thank you very much. This one, coming in from EndoXD, says, Thanks, guys. Fun debate. Love listening to Erica. And also, I have a question from Mr. Batman. If that's how fossils form, shouldn't there be tons and tons of fossils due to the flood? Thanks. And then they also asked if Erica could respond. Absolutely. Uh, there are tons and tons of fossils because of the flood. We find of them all over our planet. Like I said before, a couple, three times, billions of dead things laid down by sedimentary layers of water all over our planet. You're up, Miss Erica. Okay, cool. Um, yes. It, the thing about the flood is that the flood requires a, a ubiquitous type of fossil burial. In my opinion, I haven't seen a model that can allow, uh, that has been fleshed out, I should say, because Mr. Batman offered offered some, some um, thoughts on this as well. Uh, but I think that you have to have a, a model that's going to really flesh out how you're going to get all of these different types of fossilization that, fossilization that we see, and more importantly, in the order that we see them, right? So yes, water, uh, rapid burial is going to be a great way to get a fossil. That's true. This planet is also 75% water. So it's not surprising that we see a lot of fossils that are buried under those conditions. Um, again, the prediction from the flood perspective, I would propose would be that there is this, this uh, universal set of criteria that can be applied to all fossils and identify them as having been uh, flood fossils. Because if the flood boundary is where most creationists say it is, or a lot of creationists say it is, uh, that being at the at the Cretaceous, um, uh, from the, the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, then there should be very clear differences in the fossils that we find in the flood layers versus the non-flood layers. Because everyone knows we find fossils that are from like fossils of mammoths and things of that nature. Sorry, I got a dog barking. Um, and, and other ancient critters from the Cenozoic. But I don't think we find a, a huge difference in them. So how is it that we're getting Cenozoic fossils of things like Purgatorius or Afropithecus or Indricotherium, organisms that were I don't think many creationists would identify them as flood buried organisms. Um, and why are their fossils so indistinguishable in many cases from the ones that are that are flood fossils? Sorry, long winded, like I said, <laughs> always long winded. <laughs> Thank you, Bubba Gum Gun as well, says speed limits, quote unquote, are from God are a social construct. Well, again, speed limits are laws of man. And, and here's the problem with laws of man. If there is no God, then why is there any particular thing that's absolutely morally wrong? You see, conventional laws are laws of man changed by man. And you can change the speed limit. The speed limit outside of my house right now is 35 miles an hour. They could change it to 55 tomorrow. 
because they just choose to do so. But we can't change laws of logic. We can't change laws of physics. You can't change laws of biology. This, these are established by a loving, living, logical lawgiver God who is unchanging. In the book of Malachi, it says, I am Yahuwah, I am God, and I change not. You got it. And thank you very much for this question coming in from Fat Man Strikes Again. Given that this is basically pure smack talk, we'll give you a chance to respond, Mr. Batman. They say, Erica, your was right. You was right when you said you were the only one using the scientific method in this debate. Mr. Batman used a lot of probablys and maybes. Fat man coming after Mr. Batman like that. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. But Mr. Batman, you got it. You can't just let him treat you that way. Oh, I'm used to it. Um, the fact of the matter is, is uh, again, I, I don't think I said probably or maybe other than when we were talking about the possibilities of things that we're not sure about that happened in the past that are not designated in the scripture. God's word is truth. Now, where I never said possibly or could be is laws of nature. I know for a fact where those come from. Those have to come from a loving, living, logical lawgiver God. Without an eternal, universal, unchanging lawgiver, then you don't have eternal, universal, and changing laws. These are called metaphysical laws because they have to come from outside of the physical realm. That means that God is exerting his will on the physical world at all times by, by maintaining these laws. If he ever took his hands off creation, we wouldn't be here to complain about it. You got it. And this one from Sunflower. Didn't see a question attached. Oh, wait. I think you just submitted one, though. You said, I don't know. Looking forward sunflower, to sunflower might just be generous. Thank you, you, Sunflower. Might. Let me know if you have a question. And then Mr. Morpheus says, Thank you, Sunflower. Erica, can you tell us what role do pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers play in speciation? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, pre- and post-zygotic barriers. Your, your post-zygotic barriers, too, are going to be a lot fleshed out quite a bit by things that are occurring again in the environment around organisms. Prezygotic barriers, they they tend to be um they tend to be less selected for by the big E environment, as in like the literal habitat that the organism is living in. Uh, but they can they can aid in in speciation. Those prezygotic barriers too, they, they're not always foolproof, right? I mean Things like um, a, a classic example is, and thank goodness this is theoretical work and not like not like actual work that's been done. Uh, but the main barrier to entry for for the hybridizability of a human and a chimpanzee is actually the zona pellucida. It's like it's it's the outer layer of the egg. It gatekeeps sperm, and it's what decides whether or not uh, insemination is actually going to occur. That that's a prezygotic barrier that's important. <laughs> but theoretically, something like artificial artificial insemination can bypass that barrier. I mean, that's what's been done in a lot of our artificial organisms that we have today, GMOs and things of that, GMO animals and things of that nature, um, in order to, to ensure that insemination does occur, whether it's a mechanical barrier or uh, something more, more simplistic like that. Um, both of those are really important and do aid in speciation, but because biology is messy, it's always a gradient. It's never a sure thing. And it's also not necessarily going to be passed down the right way. Um, mules can sometimes be fertile, right? So, you know, messy, always messy. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from Xanos Carthage says, what do you guys think about turtles? Do you like them? Love them. I think they're interesting, uh, but I will never eat one because they're an unclean animal. I wouldn't eat one because I imagine they probably taste like a mix of like fish and chicken. I wouldn't like that. I'm not into that. <laughs> wouldn't like it. But I do I do try to help turtles when I see them trying to cross roads. I, I live near a little creek. And so sometimes when I'm going running, I see turtles that are like climbing up out of the water to get up to the bridge, you know, and I'm just like, no, 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 no. And then, you know, it's a whole ordeal because you got to wash your hands because it's salmonella, but it's worth it. I'm, I'm a turtle. I am a turtle uh, representer out here where I live. Juicy. And when you do touch the turtle, yeah, you, you get salmonella. Is there anything else you can get by touching a, a wild turtle? I mean, you're, you're not going to get infected by very much just by touching it. But what you really don't want to do is like, you don't want to like lick a wild turtle, you know? Oh. 
You really don't want to do that. They're in water Is that, that like can kissing be... a frog. <laughs> well, I imagine those. I imagine those things are very similar. I imagine that a lot of what they're carrying is probably to do with where they're living. So, oof, yeah. You got it. Well, that's Thank why. That. That's why God de- designates what is clean and unclean, and that's why Noah knew what to take on the ark that was clean and unclean. You yeah, got but it. I, isn't pork unclean? And I like pork. I do like pork. Yep, it's unclean. Yeah. Fat man strikes again, says, sorry, I was late to the debate. Erica, did you bring up the heat problem and explain it to Mr. Batman that if the flood actually happened, he wouldn't be here to debate it? We had a long conversation about the heat problem. Fat man, thank you for asking. Uh, Watch the debate and let me know what you think. Juicy. And folks, I want to let you know, we are excited for several reasons. One, both Mr. Batman and Erica are linked in the description. You can click on their links Oh, baby, you guys, what are you waiting for? If you have been enjoying listening to either speaker or maybe both speakers, what are you waiting for? Their links are waiting down in the description. And that includes if you're listening via podcast as we put all of our debates, folks, on our podcast. And in each podcast, we put in the description box the links for each of our guests. Last one from Raw Nakedness says, For Erica, in the Morrison Formation of Oklahoma, the bones weren't moved very far from where the dinos died. How did you get a dino community to die in close proximity to one another? In, in that case, if I'm remember, I just hit my mic again. Sorry if I blew everyone's eardrums out. Um, <laughs> if I, yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, in the case of the more, in the case of the one you're talking about, what you're getting is you're getting these massive flash floods that come through the area, seasonal flooding. A lot of this is seen by like how the deposition is actually occurring downstream and how it's occurring at places like river bends. And unfortunately, when flash floods happen, we see this again today in areas where there are sharp bends. You can get a, a buildup of like lots of debris, so large logs, um, mats of vegetation, things like that. Uh, And then when you have an organism that's swept away but not necessarily killed and they get smacked up against this debris, perhaps a large herd of them, and we also see this with deer and cattle today, unfortunately, they tend to drown there because they can't fight the current forwards and they can't go from side to side because it's such a a, a tangled mess of, of, you know, uh, foliage and and trees and branches and, and things like that. Um, I, I think it tends to be not uncommon too. I mean, it's not uncommon today just because rivers tend to wind and flash floods happen. And, you know, uh, unfortunately a lot of our ungulates aren't super intelligent. So they, they hang out in big groups and, and get washed away and things happen. Unfortunately, a lot of times those, those big dinosaur graveyards are, are big herbivores too. Um, they tend to be like Edmontosaurs and, and other, um, you know, types of animals like that. So herd animals living in groups, it, it seems like a big analogy to what we see today. I, I think it's a it's fair to draw the comparison at the very least. You got it. And man. I believe we would actually see that in the, the flood uh, geology as well, because again, that would also be um, conducive to a tsunami type of effect of the animals being swept away in this very same manner. You got it, Dan. Sunflower says, my question, okay, this is the one we missed, to be fair. Mm. Said, my question was, epigenetic mechanisms that directly modulate chromatin structure do not have any analogs in extant species, of course. Is epigenetic modulation irreducibly complex? Yeah, I don't know as much about the epigenome as I should. It's also not very well known to, to scientists in general. I know the a lot of epigenetics work has been done comparing humans and chimps, and DNA methylation tends to be like one of the bigger differences between us. So for those who don't know, epigenetics are the switches that um, that that turn on turn on and off effectively and, and activate, tell the genes what to do and when to do it. Um, in in the case of what you're talking about, I think the big problem is going to be it's a lot harder to trace. I think epigenetics is a lot harder to trace than just like base pairs as it were. So that's like my tentative answer to it, but I I would honestly need to look more into it. You so got thank it. you for, for spurring that though. I think epigenetics is a very interesting uh, field of science as well, because like you mentioned, those are the switches that turn different genes on and off. And those need yep. to be explained from a designer position. What put them there? What makes them work the way they do? I love asking the why question. 
yeah, the why questions are are what it's all about. That's the most fun part of science. So, you know, I, I, agree. I agree. And I could definitely know a lot more about epigenetics. That's a weak spot for me. You got it. And with that, folks, we do want to say we want to respect the time of our debaters. we got to get them out of here before it's two and a half hours. So <laughs> they've been hanging out with us for a long time, and we appreciate that. Their links are in the description. Also, folks, as mentioned, a lot of juicy debates coming up. In fact, I don't know if you guys saw this during the debate. I would put already you had seen the one that has Aaron and Dr. Jackson debating next Tuesday. But also tomorrow, bottom right of your screen, whether or not the Titanic actually sank. That is going to be a juicy tag team debate. You don't want to miss it, folks. It's going to be a fun new topic, and we're excited about it. So, again, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And so thanks so much, Erica and Mr. Batman. It's been a true pleasure to have you. Yeah, it's always fun to be here. Every every time. I'm Listen, I'm always hankering for fun conversations. So, you know, you know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Mr. James. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. And it's been a pleasure getting to meet and talk to you, Miss Erica. Uh, I do appreciate that you slowed down a little bit for me because my old ears really appreciate that. <laughs> Listen, I go, I operate fast and at a very high frequency. My voice is nasally and I talk a lot. So I appreciate you for putting up with it. <laughs> no problem. It's been a pleasure. And with that, I will be back in a moment, folks, with some updates on upcoming debates. So stick around for that. And thanks again to our guests who are linked in the description. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for being with us. I am excited to be back. It's been six whole days since our last debate stream. And so I am excited to greet you. I want to say thanks so much for all of your support. Thanks so much for being here with us. We just appreciate you guys. Want to let you know, I couldn't agree more. Oliver Catwell, we are so thankful that you mentioned that the national suicide prevention number, which I have linked in the basically in the chat, and I pinned it to the top of the chat. Can't say this enough, folks, that if you are contemplating suicide, anything like that, please do call that number. We highly encourage you, call that number, get professional help. It will get better. It will get better. You have to believe that. And sometimes in life, I've found personally that you have to believe and you have to have the hope and you, and you have to believe it'll get better, even when it just, it, it doesn't feel like it at all, like your emotion is telling you like, no, 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 it won't get better. But you have to just nonetheless persist and, and believe it'll get better. And so seek out professional help. We want you to know as well that you are welcome here no matter what walk of life you are from, whether you be Christian, atheist, Muslim, Republican, Democrat, black, white, gay, straight, you name it. Folks, we are glad you are here. We really do hope you feel welcome. It's truly a melting pot. And while people might debate in both on stream as well as in the old live chat, we want to let you know that, folks, ultimately, we agree on several things, and we are a community that agrees on these things together. And those are things such as everybody, we want everybody to have, the, you could say, their fair shot at making their case on a level playing field namely a neutral platform, and that's what we're trying to do here, as well as making the world a better place. Tomorrow night, we're excited that we're, it's been the first time in a while we're going to have during this epic Titanic debate. So there it is right there. That's the thumbnail. We are excited, folks, that we're actually going to have that be a charity stream. And so I actually think this is a great idea. So maybe what we'll do is a, a charity related to the topic of namely preventing suicide. That's actually a great idea in terms of, so Oliver Catwell, we, we appreciate you mentioning that. And so we're excited for that, folks. Don't miss out on that debate tomorrow. And hey, I mean, like throw in a super chat tomorrow because that is going to be really epic as we are excited to do that charity stream for this good cause. And that's something that I would say, again, no matter what walk of life, I would say we all agree on this. 
No matter what walk of life you are, we don't want you to commit suicide. If you are contemplating suicide, I can tell you that the atheists, the Christians, the agnostics, the Muslims, you name it, everybody would agree on this, that we want you to seek the help of a professional. Do not take your own life. We want you to seek the help of a professional and believe that it will get better. Even if it doesn't feel like it, it will get better. Persist through. And so we are excited Tomorrow, oh yeah, so someone said tomorrow's uh, debate doesn't have the link or the, the uh, names. RJ Downard and Leo are going to be partnering, taking on Alex Stein and Rose. Uh, you guessed it. <laughs> so it's going to be a great debate, my friends. We are excited about it. We really do. We really do want you to make it. It's going to be a lot of fun tomorrow night. And so we do appreciate you guys, seriously. We do appreciate you hanging out here. It's always fun. And so good to see you. I want to say hi to you in the old chat. Raw Nakedness, good to see you, as well as Oliver Catwell. And then General Balzac, good to see you. Master QT1, glad you're here. Chris O, oh, thanks for dropping in. Bubblegum Gun and Da Freak, as well as Tick Talic and Chick Harigo. Thanks for dropping in. Let Tornado, good to see you again. Ed Luckenbill, thanks for dropping in. Truth is beautiful. We're glad you're here. Adam and Evo, thanks for dropping in. And General Balzac, good to see you. Rebuke and Reprove, we're glad you're here. As well as Waiting to Die, we're glad you're here. And then Creo Debunk, we're glad you're here. As well as DeFreak and Mark Reed. Stevie6621, thanks for dropping in. As well as Chad Ingram and Adam and Evo. Ed Luckenbill, we're glad you're here as well. And Heat Shield, want to say we're excited, folks. For the future, we have a lot of juicy upcoming debates. You probably already saw it because we showed it on screen tonight many times. RN will be returning. He'll be debating Andrew Jackson. That'll be a juicy one on evolution, so you don't want to miss that. And we're also excited to let you know, folks, if you did not know in the chat right now, I am going to pin it. We highly encourage you, check out our Discord. It's like a fun community there. Really neat place that Larry Letts has done, among other moderators, but especially Larry has put in so much time making the Discord for Modern Day Debate awesome. We want to encourage you folks, don't forget, like, check out the Discord. It's awesome. It's got kind of the general room where it's kind of like chat, and then it also has the voice rooms where they're currently working on doing things such as official Modern Day Debate after shows as well as moderated debates in there. You could say almost like a training ground if you want experience debating. And that's something that we'd highly encourage you to check out. And then, and truth is beautiful. We're glad you're here. Adam and Evo, thanks for coming in. And Karen, Bees, we're glad you're here. And then let's see. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit offensive of a username. I've got to let you know that we're, we're not going to let you have like a, like it's just too gross and weird. So something that's not, so uh, personally harassing somebody because we don't want people harassing people in the chat. That's a rule that we've had for a very long time. And so do have to let you know, like we're not going to let you, you're going to have to come up with a new username if you want to hang out here. And just the way it is, that's the bottom line. But my dear friends, we are excited. Many upcoming debates. Let me share some of them with you right now. We're excited. I did get a word back from Vegan Gains coming back this month. That's going to be a juicy one. And then other ones coming up. Let me just pull these up, show you guys some of the deets, share with you what's going down. We're excited about these. Amazing. So we might, I'm waiting on, I'm waiting on finding out what Friday's debate will be. That is up in the air, but I'm pretty sure it'll be a juicy one. So you don't want to miss that either. Then Saturday, I suspect we'll probably have, you guessed it, a flat. So this is next Saturday. So this is like eight days from now. Potentially a new flat earther who says that he is the bomb. He says he really is that good. And then also this coming Monday, Kay and Kaz will be debating assisted suicide. You guys don't want to miss that. It's going to be a cordial discussion, believe me. Even though it's a controversial topic, I can guarantee you it's going to be a professional, friendly discussion on these deep issues. And then Brenton and the Hake Report, James, Brenton and James of the Hake Report will be debating on Monday the 16th. 
And then Aussie versus T-Jump on whether or not space exists is coming up on Friday the 20th. We're going to finally get to the bottom of that one. So it's going to be a juicy one. My dear friends, I'm excited about the future. We want to say thanks for all of your support of the channel. Thanks for just being here and making it awesome. We do appreciate you. It's always fun. Truth is beautiful. We're good to, glad to see you. Farron Salas, good to see you. And Beelzebub, thanks for dropping in. And so, want to let you know, folks, we're excited about the future. I will be back tomorrow night. I'm excited to get to actually do the good old moderating tomorrow night for whether or not the Titanic really sank. So stick around. Be there for that, folks. Oh, the Twitch chat. Sorry, folks. My dear friends in the Twitch chat, Chapatzel and Andrew the Axolotl. Let me know if I'm pronouncing your name right. We're glad to see you, Andrew. And Surgeon General 777, thanks for dropping in, as well as Tapatzel and Brooke Sparrow. And I'm repeating myself. Forgive me for that. Pothold, thanks for coming in. And then my, my working memory is pretty shot. I'm, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. It's been a long day. But we're going to make it, folks. We're excited about the future. We will persevere. Believe me, my dear friends. Life can be hard sometimes. Life can be challenging. There's no doubt about it. We're thankful, though, that we are strong and we are going to persist. Don't ask for a light load, my friends. Ask for a strong back. We are going to persevere. No matter what roadblocks get thrown in front of us at Modern Day Debate, we are going to continue to grow. We are going to continue to fulfill the vision of providing a level playing field so everybody can make their case in the fairest way possible. Thanks, Allison Wonderland. we glad to see you there, Allison, in the old Twitch chat. And let's see here. Is that, oh, it's YouTube chat's moving fast. Uh, Saito Nav says, Lewis Barnett is ready for the wrench. Let's see, let me find Lewis, and I will wrench him up right now. Lewis Barnett says, turtles are cool. I couldn't agree more, Lewis. We're glad you're here. Thanks for being a moderator, seriously. And thank you, moderators, for doing a fantastic job. Seriously. You guys do a superb job in terms of cleaning up the hate speech and the harassment and stuff like that. So thank you, moderators, for all of your time and dedication. And Shikarigo says, did he say it was a tag team debate tomorrow? Yes, it is. And it's going to be a juicy one. Let's see. Thanks for your kind words, Saito Now That seriously means a lot. I had Honestly, i got to be honest with you guys. I'm not going to go into detail, but today was like the, the worst day I've had since um, in March. I found out a, a good friend. I, I had shared with you this uh, back then. I found out a good friend had passed away, and it was really hard, obviously. That was a really, really, I mean, like I'm still, it's still something I think about every day. My friend who had passed on, but today was another really hard day. No one had passed on. Um, could be thankful for that. But nonetheless, it was a really hard day today. And so I just want to say thanks for your support, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for everything. You guys make it fun. And this is fun for me to get to do this. Like, it puts me in a good mood. So I'm just glad to be here. I appreciate you guys. But nonetheless, as I, have, as I had mentioned, my dear friends, don't ask for a light load in life. Now, I wish I had my friend back. And there are other things that I wish were different. But nonetheless, my dear friends, despite the difficult circumstances, we can say, hey, we're glad, we're strong, we're perseverant. We are going to make it. We are going to keep pushing forward. We have big dreams, big goals. We are excited about those. And so we're going to keep pushing forward, folks. We are going to keep the hope and we're going to keep doing big things. And so Let's Farm says, so sorry. Hope it all works out. Thanks, Larry. Seriously, that means a lot. Seriously, it's been a, like a really hard day. So that means a lot. And then thanks for your kind words. Evans Kiptu, we appreciate that. Says, thanks indeed for being a neutral channel. Thanks so much. That means a lot. And let's see here. Oh, yeah, but yeah, folks, do check out the, the Discord. It's a cool community. Thanks to Larry and the other mods, especially Larry, those who put so much time into it, and we're, we're, we appreciate that. So uh, give Larry a, a pat on the back, say thanks, because we really do appreciate that. Because I, I, I just, with the, the doctorate alone is honestly extremely exhausting, and uh, I've mentioned that before, so it's, it's hard. 
especially the last, like, yeah, it's, it's gotten harder. But don't worry. I'm going to make it. Like, Lord willing. That's, like, I'm absolutely determined. It's, it's, um, but it is challenging. Sometimes it wears you out. Sometimes they get a little burnt out, to be honest. And so I haven't been able to do anything in the Discord. All credit to Larry. I um, want to say thanks so much to Larry for making it awesome, though, because I get, I get positive feedback about it, or people are like, this is great. This is a great community. It's really fun. And so I just appreciate that uh, from everybody in Discord. Lewis Giles says, uh, damn, man, sorry to hear. Thanks for that. Seriously, that means a lot. And Adam in Evo says, we need hardships. That's true. It makes us stronger. We are in the crucible sometimes. And nonetheless, it makes us stronger. It makes us tougher. It makes us able to bear more. And that I really do believe. As I said, there are you know things in which a case like I wish I had my friend that he was still here. And I wish that there were other things that were different. Some things that I, you know, one thing I found out today where I was like, oh, I wish that they were different. But nonetheless... The crucible of life, whether it be, and for me, like the doctorate is always pushing me into burnout and all these different things. Nonetheless, it puts us in the crucible. It stretches us. And when we take on as much as we can possibly bear, we're able to get used to it. We get kind of, you know, adapted to it. And then we can add just a little bit more and we get used to that and we adapt to it. And we can take on a little bit more and we keep pushing forward and doing bigger and brighter things. So... We appreciate that. It's true. It's wise words. And then, where is it? Coach. Coach Russ, thanks so much for being here. Says, I think I used to pick on you in high school. I don't know. Maybe. I doubt we went to the same high school. I don't remember anybody named Russ making fun of me. Let's see. I'm trying to think of, I knew a Russ in college. uh, Russ Foster. I think that was his name. But I, I don't think you're him. But uh, if you if you if you uh, if you picked on me, I've got no hard feelings. I, apparently, it wasn't too bad. I don't remember it. But Lewis Barnett says thanks, James and Nav. I hope uh, I hope I can help modern day debate stri- strive as much as I can. Thanks, Lewis. Seriously, that means a lot. Really, it does. Is it's a community effort. We're excited, and we were talking recently about the new banners that we're working on. And I said, should we have, you know, like, because I was like, you know, sometimes uh, YouTube channels to personalize it will put their picture in the banner. And I was like, hey, should we do that? And I was like, you know what? But we like that modern day debate is a symbol. It's like, it's such that if someone wanted to pick it up and take it over, if I, let's say, went to outer space on a trip with Jeff Bezos at all, someone else could take over modern day debate and keep running it and it could be continuously epic and the idea is it's a symbol it's not dependent on a single person it's a symbol and the channel is something different in that way because that's the thing is like don't get me wrong more power to those channels where it's you know it's like hey this is jeff's youtube channel that's cool don't get me wrong i've got nothing against it but we also like that it's a symbol modern day debate is always striving for that vision we are going to provide a neutral playing ground a level playing field a way that everybody can make their case where it's fair that's our vision we're carrying it out and that's abstract it's symbolic and in a way by being that way it can't be killed or it can't be dependent upon a single person who might be like well i can't do the channel for whatever reason you know my job says i can't do it anymore or whatever else if it ever came to be the case that let's say my phd program or something highly unlikely they're actually like they're like well he's like I'm moderating. I'm not even debating. How is that controversial? Is that if theoretically, I have, let's say my program said, hey, uh, you can't do the channel anymore. Somebody else could pick up the baton. They could pick up the torch and keep forging ahead with the vision. And that's something we like about modern day debate. And so long story short, my picture won't be in the banner. You don't have to see my mug in the banner. <laughs> Louis Barnett, uh, let's see. Yeah, thanks for your kind words. And then Jafreek, thanks for your support. And then ITR, Isaac, we're glad you were here, Isaac. And then GG, Bianco, thanks for dropping in. And then, let's see, Mark Reed, thanks for your kind words. Said, my sincere condolences, James. That's hard, buddy. I appreciate that, Mark. Seriously, that means more than you know. It really do. Your support means a lot. I'm serious. And Tapasal says, also, the podcast. That's right. We do have a, a podcast, folks. If you didn't know, if you've been living in a cave on Mars with your fingers in your ears, we have a podcast. And we try now, we're, we're pretty good at this. We usually get a stream up 
uh, are we usually get each debate up within 24 hours of when the debate happened. And so highly encourage you, if you haven't yet, pull out your phone, my dear friends. Uh, see that? Pull out your phone, and you can find us right now by pulling out your favorite podcast app right now. Look for Modern A Debate. We're really excited, my dear friends, as I'm excited. It's been useful to people, and I'm like, hey, that's great. Like, that's encouraging. And then thanks, Flat Tony, for your kind words as we love your work, James. That seriously means a lot, Flat Tony. Seriously, you have no idea. On a day like this, it's especially encouraging. So thank you. And thanks for your super chat, Bubblegum Gun says, Modern Day Debate, Neff wants to 1v1, people want it. Eh, I don't know. I, it, it would depend. You, first, I, I, you know, it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, maybe, but it really depends. Email me. But that's, that's how I set up actual debates is like through email. And so maybe. Uh, that's all I can see. I got to figure out more specifics. For example, like using a camera. We're not going to have two guys who are not using a camera. Neff never uses a camera. We grandfathered him in. No pun intended. Uh, we <laughs> grandfathered him in because Neff helped us when we had like 30 live viewers. And we were like, whoa, we had 30 live viewers. And Dougie was like, that is cool. There's you know, nothing wrong with that. Like Nephilim Free was willing to come on because he just loves to debate. So he's helped us a lot. And so I'm, I kind of like let him get away with it. Or I'm like, yeah, if you don't want to have to, you know, because Neff has helped us a lot. However, we're not going to have two people on the stream. This isn't talk radio, people. It's a YouTube channel. So, we're, we're, you know, somebody's got to use a camera here. And it's not just me. Let's see here. Henry Hansen, good to see you. And Perfect One says, misery may not actually enjoy company, but commiseration can make a pretty good salve. Sorry to hear about your friend. Know this, you are not alone. Thanks, Perfect One. Seriously, it really does mean a lot. I'm encouraged by that. And Adam and Evo says, Modern Day Debate appreciate the platform and values of openness and acceptance of humanity you promote. That seriously means a lot. Seriously, I, I do appreciate that. And then... Chat's moving fast for me. Let me catch up. I'm a boomer here, guys. Hang with me. Bear with me. Lyric Edge, good to see you, says, am I late, James? Yes, you are. <laughs> the debate already happened, but we're glad you're here nonetheless. Better late than never. And then Ron Nakedness says, E.O. Wilson versus Richard Dawkins. Topic, Genic versus group selection, The Reckoning. That would be epic. I'm sure I'd, I mean, even for a topic like that, which is like a little dry, I'm sure, like, we'll see. We'll work on it. Because I'm not I'm very serious when I say that. Hope, our hope is someday that we would actually be able to host people like Dawkins. The Freak says, James reminds me of the super nerd in school that would bust off a 4.3 40-yard dash. That's funny. Oh, I appreciate that. Sideshow Nav says, 205 likes already. Right on. Keep them coming. Folks, we can totally get to 210. We're at 205 right now. We can totally get to 210. Hit that like button. I'll show you what's behind the curtain. You guys may not know it. It looks like there's a picture. You know, it looks like an office behind me. This is just a curtain. Watch me pull it. No, I'm kidding. This is real. <laughs> but I should have put a green screen and then just used the picture of this. And then I could have actually like pulled the curtain. You'd be like, whoa. But we are excited, folks. Thanks for all of your support. We love you guys. Seriously, it's a community here. I love you guys. You mean a lot to me. I'm excited about the future. And this is just the beginning. I'm telling you guys, five years, eight years from now, 10 years from now, when Modern Day Debate is monstrous, and we'll be like, wow, you remember back in the day, like, like we were like, you know, 50,000 subscribers, or what is it now, 51,000, 51,200 subscribers. We'd be like, wow, you know, it was like, that was kind of, you know, it was back when we were small still. We we're still in our infancy as we've got a lot of big things coming forward. And so... I do love you guys. I will see you next time, which is tomorrow. Don't miss it, folks. It's going to be juicy. And keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Take care, everybody. Love you guys. Amazing. Beta. Beta male.